All right, we're on the record. Uh, welcome back, everyone. We'll go ahead and proceed with the next witness. I understand the attorneys have agreed um, that Judge Hobbs can call a witness out of order. So, Mr. Randolph, you may proceed. Yes, Your Honor. Please, the court, I'd like to call Bishop A.J. Richardson to the stand. All right, sir, if you'll raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes. All right, thank you. You may be seated. Good morning, Bishop Richardson. Morning. All right. Now, Bishop Richardson, if you have any problems in, in uh, speaking with your mask on, <laughs> please let us know. All right. I don't mind. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <Is that good? laughs> All right. Would you state your complete name for the record? Adam Jefferson Richardson, Jr. All right. And you're known primarily as Bishop Richardson, is that correct? That's right. And what church are you now presently the bishop? I serve as the bishop for the 11th Episcopal District of the African Methodist Episcopal Church better known as the AME Church, uh, which covers the state of Florida and the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. All right. So you were in, in charge of both districts? That, yes. Just uh, that district. Covers uh, Florida, headquartered in Jacksonville, and we maintain a residence there in Jacksonville. Uh, and we're registered voters there in Jacksonville, Duval County. Now, Bishop, prior to the time that you took this position, were you also a minister here in Tallahassee, Florida? Yes. And would you tell the, the panel exactly where you were? Yeah, for 18 years at Bethlehem Church here in Tallahassee. Right. Now, is that the same Bethlehem Me on Orange Avenue here in Tallahassee? Very same one. Yes. Would we're here today, Bishop, regarding a, an, a, a judge Barbara Hobbs. Do you know Barbara Hobbs, Judge Hobbs? Yes. Would you tell this panel how long you've known her? Well, beginning in the mid-1980s, through her brother, actually, who became a member of our congregation in about 1985. Somewhere along that time, he and his family united with our church uh, he and his wife and their two children uh, united with that church. And subsequent to that, uh, he became a preacher. He started preaching under my administration. Uh, his wife was a school principal. And his children were in school with our children. And they became very active. And along with that, uh, we came, became familiar with his uh, family, his siblings, and uh, his mother and father. Uh, we knew that uh, his sister, Barbara, was also an attorney. and They set up a practice here in, uh, in Tallahassee and would sometimes frequent our church along with, uh, with their mother and father. So we knew them uh, as being somewhat frequent in and out of our church, even though they were members of the, uh, the Griffin Chapel uh, Primitive Baptist Church. Uh, but through civic activities and other uh, religious opportunities uh, to worship and to be a part of our church that was engaged in a number of civic activities would sometimes be in and out of our church as well. Now, so you've known her prior to the time that she became a judge. Okay. Yes. Now, were you involved in any particular activities with her uh, prior to the time that she became judge, in community activities? Yeah, in those activities that would be uh, in our church, our church was kind of a hub of a number of civic activities, uh, Martin Luther King uh, days and uh, other uh, concerts and those, uh, because of the size of our building, a number of those type activities and we would see one another from time to time and uh, because our families were related, uh, 
you will sometimes see one another in those type of activities. Now, her law office at that time, were you in any way uh, ever engaged with her practice before she became a judge? No, not, not really. Not, uh, I knew that she was in, in, a, in a, a law practice, and uh, we knew uh, some people who uh, we could refer to her and her, her law partner uh, in practice, but uh, I never did have any real dealings with her in her law practice. Now, Judge Hobbs, of course, ran for political office here, became the first black elected circuit judge in the history of this circuit. Were you aware of that fight, of her uh, actual campaign? Of course. Were you involved in any way in her campaign? Uh, I supported her campaign, and um, I was uh, asked by campaign manager to support her campaign, and uh, I knew that she was very meticulous about being sure that we did not in any way, well, she, was, she made sure uh, that she observed all of the, the protocols uh, that uh, kept her away from anything that would besmirch uh, her candidacy. For example, Canon 7, she did not besmirch herself with that. Uh, but uh, she was committed, for example, to, to, uh, to make sure that uh, we prayed for her. She did not ask us for money, for example. But, but we did pray for her, and I led in that. In that sense, yes, I was involved with her campaign. Now, Bishop, you mentioned Canon 7 as if you were familiar with that. Is your daughter also a member of the, of the local judiciary here in Tallahassee? Yes. And what is her name? Monique R. Richardson. All right. And she was elected as a county court judge in, here in Tallahassee? Yes. Now, <clears throat> Based on the interactions that you have had with Judge Hobbs, uh, first of all, do you, did you know that she had a family here in Tallahassee, other than her brother that you, you've expressed? About? Yes. Right. Did she have any children, to your knowledge? Yes. Right. Now, having the observations that you were able to make in regard to Judge Hobbs, uh, do you have any uh, opinions regarding her uh, opinions regarding her honesty, trustworthiness uh, that she has exhibited here in Tallahassee? Yes, uh, she has a reputation for being honest and, and, and trustworthy. I think people were quite delighted about her election. I think that people believed in her uh, first as an attorney and then upon her election. Right. Bishop, do you have an opinion as to whether or not her continued service on the circuit bench would be beneficial to this community? I feel quite certain that uh, her continued service would be an asset to this community. I can tell you this, uh, after her election, as I've done because of the way in which we operate in this state uh, and having served as a bishop now for nearly 25 years, one of the things that we try to do is to connect with local officials, to have them to come and make presentation to our district. We've had, for example, Justice uh, Pence uh, to come and address us. Uh, we, we had um, uh, Judge Hobbs to come, and so she addressed us in one of our events with more than a thousand people and uh, talk about the judicial system and that kind of thing. And uh, the people were, they received her gladly. And uh, so there's this kind of rapport that, uh, that we've uh, had with Justice, with Judge Hobbs. And uh, so that goes not just for the Tallahassee community and for the uh, 
Second Judicial Circuit, but also for the entire state. So she is appreciated uh, beyond just this, uh, this circuit and across the state. And is, is there anything about her character, Bishop, that you believe would prevent her from continuing uh, if allowed as a circuit judge here in this region? I don't think there's anything that would, uh, in my opinion, that would uh, disqualify her or that would uh, besmirch her in such a way that uh, she would be uh, not trusted with this uh, opportunity to serve the people of this, of this state and of this circuit. Thank you, Bishop. Okay, any cross-examination? Any questions from the panel? All right, thank you, sir. Thank you very much, and you're free to go. Okay, if JQC wishes to call its next witness, you may proceed. Yes, good morning. May it please the court. Uh, at this time, the JQC will call Judge Hobbs to the stand. Watch the step. There's a step there. Okay, uh, Judge, if you raise your right hand, do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God? All right, thank you. You may be seated. Yes, sir. Good morning, Judge Hobbs. Good morning. Um, I'm pretty soft-spoken, so let me get on the yes. mic. Yes, please. Okay. Um, I am going to be as quick as I can in question you. I think the panel members certainly have questions and I believe your attorneys do as well. Um, so at the start, please state your name and spell your last name for the court reporter. Okay, my name is Barbara Hobbs Haynes. I only go by Barbara Hobbs. I've been divorced for 35 years. I don't know why I've not dropped my ex-husband's name, but um, I go by my father's name, Barbara Hobbs. And can you spell that? The last name? H-O-B-B-S. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. How long have you been an attorney? Almost more than 40 years now. All right. And primarily over that 40 years, uh, what type of law did you practice when you were a practicing attorney? I think the first 15 or 12 years of my practice was uh, antitrust. Was, I'm sorry? Antitrust. Okay. And then the second uh, period of practice was criminal defense. And that would have been uh, up until the time you were elected to the bench? Correct, yes okay. sir. And, and when was that, that you were elected to the bench? Uh, I believe I was elected in the November 2012 election cycle to be seated in January. All right, and if you would tell the members of the panel, where have you been assigned uh, since taking the bench? Initially, when I came on board, I was assigned to the family bench uh, because I had taken a seat of a family judge, and even though I was not wanting to go to family, I wanted to go to criminal, Judge Francis says, you took Judge Tamayo's seat, so you sit in Tamayo's seat, so <laughs> that's where I was, and then, um, I got assigned to the Gatson Liberty uh, Circuit Court docket, I want to say in July of 2014. I stayed there until approximately April of 2019 when I was brought back by Circuit Judge um, John, uh, Shersham. And then I stayed there until the incident with my son and then I was transferred August the 2nd to the family bench. Now, Judge Sostrom testified that the decision to switch you to the family bench after your son's arrest was his decision. Uh, is that correct? It was, um, I talked to you about wanting to, uh, maybe it was in my, maybe I should just voluntarily try to go somewhere else. 
And before I could uh, have that discussions with uh, Judge Sherstrom, he uh, and I think the administrative judge, Judge Hankerson, thought that it would be better if I was transferred to the family bench because of the situation with my son. In retrospect, it was a good decision. And just for clarification purposes, the panel members watched the video, yes, or some parts of the video yesterday, and the, the gentleman uh, that was being interviewed is, is your son? He's my oldest son. Okay, and how old is he? <laughs> Um, I think he's 32. I hate to think about it because it makes me old. I think he's 32. <laughs> I think he's 32. Okay, fair enough. Um, just don't ask me my anniversary date. I couldn't tell you. Um, well, Judge, let's start with the easy stuff. And, and I don't mean to be repetitive, but I believe in your answer to the amended formal charges, you agreed that it was improper for you to represent your son during his uh, police interview. So you would agree that that violated the code. You're familiar with Canon 5G, which says that a judge shall not practice law. Uh, is that correct? I am, yes. Okay. So would it be fair to say that when you went to the jail and you told the officer that you'd be your son's attorney, you knew that you were not allowed to do that? It would be, no, I kind of, I really didn't think about it, but I would say it was not, I shouldn't do that. You spoke to me shortly after your son's arrest uh, at the suggestion, I guess, of Judge Sostrom uh, on July 31st, and then you subsequently wrote an email to me. Do you remember that? Yes, sir. Okay. And during our phone conversation, I, I suggested to you that you should write me that email and you should refrain from any kind of preferential treatment. Do you remember that? Yes, sir. Okay. Were you the person that contacted Mr. Roberts uh, regarding your son's arrest after the shooting? I think I was, yeah. There wouldn't have been anybody else that would have. I Correct. mean, he was in custody and we don't have anybody else here. Understood. And when did that contact occur? I may have called him when I came home after leaving the police department and told him what had happened. Okay. That would have been in the early morning hours? Yes, sir. Okay. Did you contact any other attorneys uh, about your son's arrest? No. Did you contact the public defender uh, office about possibly representing your son? I think I may have asked if uh, he would qualify, but that went nowhere. Did you ask for a specific public defender to represent your son? I think I asked if, uh, if he was assigned an attorney, could he have somebody out of the county from where I was dealing? Did you name a specific person? I said, I think I asked about, what's the kid's name? Daniel Hogan, I think I've asked about him. Okay, and who did you have this conversation with? Would that have been, um, at the time, the elected public defender? I don't know who I talked to, to be honest with you, because it was in passing. Because okay. I had already retained Mr. Roberts. Okay. So you retained Mr. Roberts to represent your son. Let's talk about Mr. Roberts. Um, he started representing your son in a 2018 DUI case in 2018, is that right? Yes. Okay. And I, again, I, I believe you acknowledged in your answer that that it was improper for you to handle those cases uh, as, a, as it were. But again, I'll ask you, you agree that that was a violation of the canons? What, handle I'm, what case? I'm sorry, yes ma'am, let me be more specific. Uh, for you to preside over the criminal cases in which Mr. Roberts was representing clients in front of you at the same time he was representing your son. I didn't admit that, no. Okay, so you're aware of canon 3E that says a judge shall disqualify himself or herself in a proceeding in which the judge's impartiality might be reasonably questioned. Are you familiar with that, Canon? Yes, sir. Okay. Do you believe your impartiality might be reasonably questioned given those circumstances? The ones which I was presented with, no, sir. Okay, and why is that? Because I wasn't doing anything other than 
mechanical move of a case. Did Mr. Roberts actually appear in court in front of you with his clients in those instances? I really don't know if his clients were present. If I can explain to you how the uh, docket runs, then um, on a in a criminal mass docket, which is what I was handling that those two days, um, I don't know who because benchmark or smart bench doesn't indicate, at least in our circuit, the name of the defendant. So I would have just said, y'all come on up. And it was like that we call a judge call, a cattle call. So until he walked up to the podium, I didn't know he was even in the courtroom. There's so much activity going on. Um, Prisoners are being uh, shackled in and out. There are many, because I had, I think I had 200 cases on the docket that day. But you did recall seeing Mr. Roberts there. He was I president. recall him coming up and asking, he and the public, excuse me, state attorney coming up and saying, we need to pass this judge. We're going to enter into a DPA on one case. And I remember him saying in another case, can you just continue this for 30 days, judge? Okay. Are you familiar with the JEAC, that's Judicial Ethics Advisory Committee, Opinion 2012-37, which advises that a judge must recuse for a reasonable time from cases involving an attorney and law firm which represented the judge, the judge's mother, and the judge's brother in a lawsuit that settled without a trial? No, I'm not familiar with this, sir. Okay. <clears throat> Are you familiar with JEAC Opinion 2018-22, advising that automatic recusal is not required without a request when a close relative is re represented by a law firm, but whose lawyers appearing before the judge uh, on an unrelated case, but are not the same lawyers representing the judge's spouse? Are you aware of that case? Yes, sir. Okay. Did you disclose to the state that there was a pending case in which Mr. Roberts was representing your son? No. How do you know that? Uh, because one of the prosecutors had approached me at one of the prosecutor's funeral about the DUI. One of the prosecutors who? James Bevel, the supervisor of the section. Okay. And what did he say? He, he, he was talking about the case and Gary and I says, look, I think he was just talking about the case. He says, uh, I don't know if he says, I know your son is in this case, or I don't know exactly what the tenor of the uh, conversation was. But what I was telling him is, look, that's Justin's issue. He, I'm not getting in it, and I don't want to talk about it. So that was the conversation. I also knew because Gary may have told me, or I don't know how I knew, but Mr. Bevel is it was, I think the case was originally with a low level um, prosecutor, and then as a result of their finding out it was my son, Mr. Bevel, the supervisor, was assigned the case. Would you turn to tab 14 in your black binder in front of you, yes, sir. please? Tab 14, okay. Uh, tab 14. Okay. Those are the court minutes <clears throat> from the May 29th hearing uh, in which Mr. Roberts appeared uh, on behalf of uh, a client. Uh, this would be Tisha Ponder, and under the state attorney, referred to on this as the Patty, P-A-T-T-Y, is a Kalen Laux. Do you know that name? Yes, sir. Okay. As you sit here today, can you tell me if you disclosed to Kalen Laux that, that, that you, uh, Mr. Roberts was representing your son? No, I cannot sit here and tell you that today, but Mrs. Laux and Mr. Bevel were both team players or team or team mates, if you will, before me in Gatson County, and they were very good friends, and she would have known that Bevel was dealing with that case. Okay, but it isn't, it's not their responsibility, it's your responsibility as the judge to make that disclosure, is that correct? Yes, sir. OK, 
Okay, if you would turn to tab 17. <coughs> also in the black binder. This is the clerk's worksheet from a June 12th hearing uh, in which Mr. Roberts appeared again, this one in the case of Madis uh, Madison Bailey Felton. And the state attorney's name is Kimberly Thompson. And judge, it's the same question. As you sit here today, can you tell the panel if you disclosed specifically to Kimberly Thompson that the, uh, Mr. Roberts was representing your son? No, sir. Okay. And you would agree that that is your responsibility as the judge to do? Yes, sir. Okay. Given our discussion now, you would agree that under the canons it would be appropriate for you to disclose or recuse from these cases? The state attorney office was familiar with my son's representation. They were fully knowledgeable of that. I do not believe I had to recuse myself in this situation. There is not a standing policy in my circuit to recuse yourself in cases is case by case. I have been talked to by the circuit uh, uh, the um, chief judge about recusals. You recuse too much, Barbara. It's shifting the caseload is what he told me. Isn't it true that conversation occurred sometime after your transfer? But that was his attitude. Everybody knew that he was not partial to recusals. And so as a result of that, it was, Recusal were done only if it was necessary on a case-by-case -case basis. So you recused too much, but in the two cases where the attorney representing your son appeared in front of you, you didn't feel recusal was appropriate? The recusal in those two cases or those cases that Judge um, Sershman was talking to me about, which I thought was appropriate, was a case of a party to this action who asked Judge Sherstrom for a standing order to recuse me from all the cases. And Judge Sherstrom would not give the standing order. So I took the initiative not to deal with any of her cases because all of them were going to be dispositive of whatever I did to recuse myself and was, taught, was basically says, it's case by case, Barbara. Are you aware of any exception to Canon 3? Three e, 3E regarding disqualification that says you don't have to disqualify if you're only doing ministerial work? No, but I'm familiar with the policy of case-by-case -case analysis. What do you believe your responsibilities are in terms of your judicial assistant? to supervise her, to um, and, and, and all the facets that come along with that. Would it be your responsibility to educate her uh, on the ethical boundaries she has to operate inside? As we go forward in the um, process of interaction, yes. And over time, I think I did. We were together for seven years, so we've had many discussions. Okay. It's your job to supervise her work product as your employee? Yes, sir. I don't have any other questions at this time. I'll tender the witness. Okay. This time only a few questions because I believe Cross has asked you about policy as to whether he, he cited a couple of cases regarding recusals. Um, you've indicated that you were not familiar with it. Had were, as the policy that was a, Judge Houston said from this witness stand regarding this recusal, was that well known among the judges here in this circuit? Excuse me. Yes, it was. And would, in regard to that policy that do you indicate that that policy is only in this circuit that applies to the judges in this circuit, but he, he, that policy may not be the policy in other circuits? True. I mean, the people on the investigative panel asked me about a standing order, and I was like, we don't do that. I've never heard of a standing order in this circuit. Right. Now, 
The two cases that, that uh, counsel asked you about, Ponder, I believe it was, and you, he also asked you about the Madison case, I believe it was. In regard to the Ponder case, <clears throat> could you tell this panel exactly what happens during the process when you mention something called a calico? What is that about? It's a mass docket. It's, um, what I had in the morning from say nine to about 12 was a mass docket. 100, 200 cases on the docket. I had to finish that docket by 12 ish so that I could be back by 1.30 to do my afternoon docket which usually included uh, motion calendars, uh, pre-trial and things of that nature. So I had to try to give the clerk some kind of break because she's sitting there all day. So you've got droves of lawyers standing in front of you trying to get to the podium. You've got, to your left, you've got the uh, jury box with <coughs> inmates coming in and out of the uh, box. They're moving them in and out because they don't bring them in all the time. So you've got inmates clanking all the way in and out of the courtroom. And you have all these people in front of you and you're trying to move a docket. So you're, you're focused on the desk, because uh, the way we have it now, we have um, Smart Bench. So it, I don't go down Smart Bench. What I just say, come on up. And folks just run up there. Now, are the private attorneys given preference? They are. They are. I'll say, I'll say, because I, what I may do is ask the public defender to defer. And I said, come on, private lawyers, come on up. Let's get this done. And they'll come up quickly. They just come up. And then I have to find their cases on the Smart Bench because it's out of order. And Mr. Roberts is, was not listed on my smart bench as attorney of record for these two cases. Well, tell this panel, you said he's not, his name does not come up automatically. How does it come up in front of you? It comes up, the only thing that's on my uh, smart bench is the name of the defendant, the numbering system to tell me basically how many cases I have, the name of the defendant, his charges, the office of the public, excuse me, the, um, the state attorney's name is there. And I noticed on the murder cases, they did have the attorney's name. But all the other little rank and file cases, they did not. Then they have a column for time standards. And that's all that's on that, that's all that I'm looking at. Now, when I was in Gadsden County, they gave me a paper docket so I could go down. And on the paper docket, it had all of the, the state of Florida versus whoever. It had the public defender, excuse me, the state attorney. It had the, the private attorney. It had everything on those pieces of paper. But we don't have paper in Leon County. So I'm I have to look at the, um, the smart bench. And the smart bench only gives you the name of the state attorney. When Mr. Roberts appeared for, in front of you on that Ponder case saying uh, that he would like to, uh, uh, I believe the Felton case is the one with the deferred prosecution agreement, but he wanted a 30-day continuance on the Ponder case. Right. Did you ask any questions at that point in time or two? First of all, this wasn't my docket. Judge Dempsey had this docket. She had set all these uh, dates. Uh, when I came in and um, she had set the dates and I came in in May, I had only been on this docket, I think about two weeks. Had you just moved over from Gaston County two weeks I just moved early? over and took her docket in two weeks. All the settings, I, all the case settings had been done by uh, Mrs. Dempsey. And so I was just taking over her docket. So I'm new to this docket. This is, the, this is probably the first week or two weeks I'm doing business in this uh, in this courtroom because I think the first week or so I was in trial and so my first business week started uh, after the trial period and so I, I mean I'm totally unfamiliar with this docket I'm just shooting as I go now just for the record uh, counsel has asked you uh, about Mr. Roberts uh, in relationship to uh, the DUI charge that your son had. 
Now, first of all, did you uh, hire uh, Mr. Roberts for the DUI case? Yes, sir. Uh, where were you at that time that you had the DUI case? In Gatson County. Had been over there for years. All right. Your son hired him on that case? My son worked at the clerk's office. And he and Gary and Mataki Abbar, but particularly Gary, he got some kind of telepathy going on with Gary. He really likes Gary and who Gary is. And so when he got the DUI, he hired Gary himself. Because, I mean, I, it, was, it was a second degree misdemeanor. I mean, I didn't think right. that I needed to get involved in at that time. All right, so at that point in time, that's the only case that was apparently pending uh, in front, pending with Mr. Roberts that your son had before the Ponder case. Before both cases. All right. And on the Felton case, there was a deferred prosecution agreement. Did you take any action whatsoever uh, in, in regard to that case? You know, that case is so weird because I don't think that they were even on the docket the day they came up in front of me on June 10th is when they came, I believe. Uh, I may be wrong, but I know that I was like, what are y'all talking about? And I don't believe that they were even on the docket that day. They were on the docket for the 12th. So they just kind of came up, the two of them, and said, Judge, we're going to do this DPA. I said, okay, fine. And I moved on. I, I mean, I, the DPAs are between the state of Florida and the defendant. I have nothing to do with a DPA. I can't order the state to give them a DPA. I can't do anything with that case. So it's a contract or relationship between the two of them. The two cases that we discussed and that counsel brought up today, were you of the opinion that you should have recused yourself on either one of those cases at the time that it was presented to you? I mean, I was... I was passing these cases. That's all I was doing is passing them to the next docket because they just appeared in front of me that morning. I may have one. And finally, counsel has cited several cases to you regarding uh, conflicts and recusals. Uh, do you, were you following those cases or were you following the chief judge at that time when you made these decisions? I didn't, I mean, I, I, don't, I didn't make a conscientious decision that this is what Jonathan wanted or this is what the case, it's like I wasn't doing anything. I was just moving them to the next docket. All right. Okay. I mean, and I needed to move on. There's 200 lawyers standing there, or 200 defendants. I have any further questions. Any redirect? No, Your Honor. Okay, let me see if there's questions from the panel. I'll start with Mr. White. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning. I am perplexed, because in my opinion, as soon as Mr. Roberts appeared in front of you, you should have recused yourself. But if I understand your testimony, you did not believe that that was necessary, correct? Actually, I mean, I didn't go through the thought pattern to say, should I recuse or shouldn't I recuse? Because I, I was just moving a case. I, in, in, to be perfectly honest with you, I didn't go through the analysis. Perhaps I should have, but yeah. I didn't go through the well, analysis. Should, I think you should have. Um, can you understand that a member? Why you just focus on eliciting facts? I'm sorry, what? You could just focus on eliciting facts from the witness. Yeah, yeah. Don't you believe that the public could perceive uh, impropriety in not recusing yourself in a case that a lawyer is representing your son? Asked, yes, I mean, I, in retrospect, yes. I mean, someone asked me that at the investigative panel, and I have made my career on trying to make sure that people who don't have a voice have a voice. And so when presented that way, I understand what uh, the, the difficulty is, I guess. But in my mind, 
That particular day, I was doing nothing. There, I don't even know if the defendants were in the room, but I know that I was doing nothing and wouldn't do anything to tip the scale one way or the other. But the perception, I, I, I get that. You also could ha issue a standing order that any cases involving Mr. Roberts should not be assigned to my division? We don't do that in the Second Circuit. It is not done, and he doesn't do it. No, I'm asking you do it. You issue an order to the clerk saying, do not assign any cases of Mr. Roberts to me because he's representing my son. I don't know if I could do it either because Judge Shershom has said no standing orders. Even though some or maybe not, maybe all of the state attorneys knew of the situation with Mr. Roberts, can you, would you agree that the state attorney may not want to file a motion to recuse you because some people, you know, that's a pretty drastic matter uh, to move to recuse a judge saying he or she cannot be fair. And it would have a chilling effect on them filing motions to recuse you? I, my, my thoughts with that is that they're really, this case, the way things went down is like, it was, it was just like this. I was moved and brought here after the docket was run or after the docket was made. And I'm not sure if anybody really knew I was there. You know what I'm saying? It's, I, was brought, I was brought in like all, it, we are not supposed to rotate until July 1st. That's the ro normal rotation where prosecutors and criminal defense attorneys would potentially look for new judges. I was brought in April 28th or something, or May, the, my docket started the first two, two weeks of May. So, I mean, they wouldn't even, nobody really knew what was going on that early because I had just gotten there. I didn't know what was on my docket. Mr. Roberts never appeared in front of me accidentally, quickly, or anything in Gadsden. I'm not sure you answered my question. My question, okay, I'm sorry. my question was, if I'm a state attorney mm -hmm. and I have a case against Mr. Roberts and it ends up in your division, I may be hesitant, I may feel reluctant to file a motion to recuse you because of the ramifications if you deny it and my case is, is still proceeding with you. When Mr. Roberts is also representing your son, so I'm asking you, don't you believe that could have a chilling effect on one's ability to want to move to recuse you, even if they knew of the situation? I don't think so. Not the relationship I share with these prosecutors. I don't think that they thought I would take any type. No, I don't think it would have had a chilling effect just on my interaction and relationship with this prosecutorial office. Uh, you were asked questions about your JA. Was she with you before you became a judge? She worked for Nancy Daniels. I stole her away from Nancy. I don't know who Nancy Daniels is. I'm sorry. <laughs> she was the uh, public defender, first woman public defender, too, I think, in the state of Florida for That's at least not about 19 years. 19 years, something like that. Well, I believe your JA has a serious, or at least in the past, a, what? Um, a serious lack of judgment. Um, for her to give a security badge to your son or her to attend these hearings involving your son. And I'm concerned that she may drag you down. I mean, I don't know what she's going to do in the future. I hope you've talked to her. But would you agree with me that the giving your son the security badge to run the courthouse was inappropriate? And she, yes, sir. Did you speak with her about that? Yes, sir. That? I counseled her pursuant to Judge uh, Shoshrom's uh, request. He's still working with you, correct? Yes. Can I, can I just make a comment? Sure. My comment is, um, I've known uh, Ms. Ware 
She actually knew my mother when my mother was working at the Transmittal 30 plus years ago. Um, when I was in private practice, uh, I interacted with Ms. Ware because she was in the public defender's office. My son interned under her when he was in high school as a with these little satellite, pro when he was about 15, lost satellite programs that um, mm. the public defender has. And Ms. Ware was, she was very, the, the personal interaction was great, okay? She helped on my campaign, and then I inquired of Nancy, Nancy, would she make a good JA? Nancy says, heck yeah, the only problem is you're still in the way from my office. So, you know, because I didn't know the woman from a work standpoint. I knew her from an interpersonal standpoint. But she had interacted with my children, and she interacted with my mother and myself and my father. Um, so I, she was hired. And she had not one iota of an issue from January 2013 when she became my JA until August the 2nd, 2019. No notice, and then I still didn't get, nobody sent me emails, nobody told me. She was getting raises, bonuses, no problem. And then all of a sudden, she became the worst JA in the building on August the 2nd. I counseled her. Since October or whenever the counseling went forward with the um, badges, she's had no problems. I just want to make sure that you don't get dragged down for, you understand what I'm I saying? I perfectly, for bad. yes sir, because a lot of those comments, if you will, today is because of my relationship or lack thereof of supervision toward her. I totally get it, yeah, what you're and saying I, to I me. I just want to make sure your personal, your judgment is not clouded by your personal relationship yes, with her and she should be fired or terminated or not but that she doesn't drag you down in the future. Because you're right, a lot of the things you're here answering for are, are things that she did. I, I, told, I, am, I am very aware of that. And, I, and I've gone over this in my brain, you know, over and over again. And I, it all goes back, however, to I've had this girl for almost six years with not an iota of complaint. And then once we went through this horrible tailspin in my life, yeah. and then, um, after the bad situation, and I was annoyed by that. That situation was kind of weird, and I will hope I get an opportunity to explain to you why that boy was up there. But um, after the bad situation, nothing. She's had nothing. Okay. Um, we as lawyers or, or panel members, you never want to assume anything, and I, I'm assuming the answers to what I'm getting ready to ask you, but I got to ask you to hear it out of your mouth. Um, you were not aware of the bad situation ahead of time, correct? No, sir. I was in um, Orlando with That's the JQC. I and you didn't know about her appearing in court on those two occasions, I did July not. 31st? I, well, uh, let me take that back. Or August 5th. Let ahead me take of time. that back. I knew on the second one. I didn't know about the first one. I knew that she was going to go on the second one. I did not, all this sitting at council table, I knew nothing about that until essentially Jonathan brought it to my attention. But I knew that she had taken lead to go to the second one. I, that, that one I did. The August 5th bail hearing? Yes, to the detention hearing, because it was set. But she wanted to go, she took her leave and she went. I did not know she was at council table until I was made aware of that by Judge Shershrom. Because I wouldn't have been involved in that myself, but that was something that I'm sure Mr. Roberts is going to tell you how that happened. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, I have no further questions. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Ms. Gonder? Your Honor, please, the court, in the interest of time, uh, it looks like we've gone into some issues that I was going to. Uh, he was going to rest, and I was going to call her back. I don't want to do that. This panel has, has, has a, a, a great deal of information already, so if I would like to uh, continue and actually uh, hopefully get the rest of the information that I would like this panel to consider without having to call her back as I normally would have in the course of my uh, case. The reason I, I didn't cut Mr. White off is because of 
the potential for any motions, but if, you, if there's no objection from, from Mr. Williams, I'm fine with you uh, continuing on the okay. questioning. I think in the interest of time, that would be. Okay, then I'll go ahead and, and Ms. Randolph, you can go ahead and do your, your full questioning of your client, and then Mr. Williams have a chance to cross-examine, then we'll do panel questions. Thank you. Sir. You want to call another witness before her? Well, were you planning, you weren't planning on calling another witness before? Uh, no, uh, Your Honor. We, I don't think, well, let me, let me check to make sure if anyone else is here. Because uh, I think I told them, based on where we were, that to show up here at around about 1030. So I think this okay. is too early for the other witnesses. His choice if he wants to. My question is, I don't want to frustrate his trial strategy. You know what I mean? That's why I ask. If it please uh, the panel, Your Honor, can we take about two minutes to make sure that no witnesses are here? And if not, I am going to continue as I suggested with okay. Judge Hobbs. All right, we'll take uh, about a three minute recess here. Mm -hmm.
That was right there. I, I stole that. And um, Mr. Randolph, Mr. Williams, my understanding that uh, basically by agreement, hmm. Mr. Randolph can uh, do part of his case, that is his examination of his client, uh, out of order so that the JQC hasn't rested yet. Is that correct? That's correct. That's correct, yeah. Okay, thank you, and you may uh, continue with your examination of your client. Judge Holmes, let's start back from the beginning. Oh, You've answered a number of questions regarding certain areas that uh, I do not intend to repeat, but I want to make sure that we uh, clarify any uh, potential areas that we have not covered. First of all, You've indicated about your background that you have been a lawyer for in excess of what, 20 years or more? 20. <laughs> 20 years. 20 years. Okay, 40 years. I'll pay you later. <laughs> All right. Now, your, did you grow up here in Tallahassee, Florida? Born and raised here, Gabby Cougar. All right. And <clears throat> has all of your practice time as far as an attorney being here in Tallahassee? No, it has not. Um, and I left out this part too, I just remember. Um, I did antitrust when I got out of law school and then I left to go to Miami and I did intimate domain. I was the general counsel, district general counsel for about 12 years or 10 years for it, the uh, Department of Transportation um, over the Dade County and Monroe County counties. And where did you work in, you said antitrust work? I did, Whom did the, you work with? the Attorney General's office. And what were you, an, an assistant? Right. Attorney General? Right. Right. <clears throat> and you left that work and came back home? I left the intimate domain practice, or not the intimate domain practice, but the transportation practice and came back home after I had my kids and got a divorce. Now, <clears throat> after you set up here in um, Tallahassee, Leon County, did you begin working in the criminal practice, a criminal area? Initially, when I went into private practice, I was doing in the domain work because that's where I had come from. But I got smitten with the criminal justice system and started doing criminal work. Now, and all of your work uh, that, that was done in the criminal side before coming to the bench was on the defense side. Correct. <clears throat> now, when did you run for circuit judge? I ran twice. The first time was the election before the one I won, which was an off presidential election. So I think it might have been 10, and then I ran again in 12. Would I that, lost the 10. All right. Would that have been around somewhere around November the 6th, 2012 that you ran the second time around? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> that was an election that covered the six counties? Right, yes. Now, once you took office, where were you assigned? Um, as I said, I was assigned to the family bench. I took over my predecessor, who I had unseated, her seat. And how many months did you stay in the family division before you moved? A good year, a good year. And who reassigned you? Charlie Francis. All right. Judge Francis was the uh, uh, judge who moved you over to Gaston County? Yes. I think he was the chief judge then, yeah. All right. <clears throat> now, tell us about the setup in Gaston County. Uh, how many judges were there on the circuit bench? There are two. There's a civil judge and there's a circuit judge. And we cover two counties. It's not just Gatson. It's uh, Liberty and Gatson. So I covered all of the criminal in Liberty and all of the criminal in Gatson, and then there's a civil judge, he covers all of the civil stuff in Liberty and all of the civil stuff in Gatson. And at that time, the first time, during the first time that you became a judge, who was your judicial assistant? Ms. Ware. All right. 
Has Ms. Ware been your judicial assistant s since the time that you were elected as a circuit judge? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Once you stayed over, you stayed it, you, you were elected and were assigned to Gaston County, were you handling all of the felony cases for murders, Every, anything else? Everything that came through the door, I dealt with it. The only reason I wouldn't deal with a case is if, because I had a very active criminal practice. So if I didn't, if I had represented a defendant, I would, uh, <clears throat> and I didn't think I wanted to deal with this, Defenders, I would probably ask the civil judge to do it. And it wasn't necessarily a reassignment. I would just go and ask him if he would handle it. All right. But other than that, you handled all of the cases that came in front of you. came through the door. Now, did you seek a, well, first of all, before we go there, were there any programs that you were involved in setting or instituting there in Gaston County before you, you left? When I got to Gadsden County, there was a, because we are, uh, Gadsden County is in the same county with the North Florida Hospital, Chattahoochee. When I got to Gadsden County, we had a volume of mental health cases because everybody in the state sends they uh, incompetent people to me and then they commit crimes inside the institution and they ends up before the court. I noticed during my time there that these defendants were not being serviced by the service providers or the, um, the service provider or the public defender's office. They would lie to me. They would tell me, oh, judge, uh, we ordered a competency evaluation and it should be in next court docket. And then I get to the next court docket and they say, oh, judge, we ordered a, a competent evaluation, it should be in the next court docket because I didn't remember. So finally I decided to set me up a mental health court where just mental health patients would come in, uh, clients would come in on one time a month. So, and then uh, Tallahassee sent me a uh, manager, court ma a case manager for that court docket. And I was able to keep up with people then when they would tell me that they had ordered stuff. But I had the, DCF come in, children and families come in, I had the hospital, I had all of the providers there on one day so they couldn't do this to me anymore and tell me this was going on when they knew it wasn't going on. So I started this mental health court and I tried to do it when I came to Tallahassee but Judge Hankinson was not interested in dealing with that. But that was the first mental health court in the second judicial, well not the second judicial circuit in Gadsden and Liberty. Now in Gadsden County, is that the only predominantly black county in the state of Florida? I don't know if it's the state of Florida, but it's definitely the second circuit. <laughs> the, so you had that program, did you have community input with the, the mental health program that you developed? With the sheriff's office, he was very happy about it because his people were sitting in that jail for months, I mean, doing just the most foulest things, and he couldn't get any help. I had uh, the mental health people. I mean, everybody was happy because the case was, they were moving because there was no more lies, if you will. So, and then the other thing that I did is I, and I got an award for this, is I helped to reduce the jail population by forcing the movement of cases and to set up some sort of pretrial release because, I mean, when I got over there, those sheriff deputies didn't have a standard barn schedule. If you had a possession of marijuana, you spent days in jail before you saw a judge. So those, now, was that something that was required of you by Tallahassee, that is, your chief judge, or is that something that you instituted on your own, these programs? I developed a relationship with that community. I went to their baptisms at the jail. I went to their graduations. I just, did, I just, I, I bought into that community, that and Liberty County. All right. Now, this program that you set up in Gaston County was that also a program in other counties outside mm -hmm. of Leon? No. I mean, I think they had something going on in Leon, but it wasn't very much, and they didn't want me to transport that docket over here because I tried 
And because a lot of the people who were I was dealing with asked me, well, when you go to Tallahassee, you're going to do this in Tallahassee? And I tried, but Judge Hankinson did not, um, he didn't want to deal with that. All right. So this, yours, the program that you helped develop was the only one in this circuit. Right. Can I interpose an objection? And I do hate to interrupt Mr. Randolph, and I recognize these questions. Can you get some relevance to the charges and the facts of the case? Yeah. Response? Yes, Your Honor. I believe that we have a, uh, uh, I have a right to uh, at least tell this panel exactly what kind of judge she has been all the time. And I'm not going to go any further into detail on it, but I do think that they have a right to know what, what has happened to her in the past. I'll overall the objection, you know, in, in part based on the fact you said you're not going to go into too much detail. Yes. Now, other than those two programs, um, did you have any other uh, awards that you received over there in Gaston County before coming to Tallahassee? Not in Gaston County. The other thing I was doing, I was the, um, what do you call that thing? I was the general counsel at one point for Mothers in Crisis because of the addiction issues in my family. All right. Now let's move to uh, Leon County. And if we would, if you would, I'd like to go down uh, when you first came to Leon County, when you transferred over here, uh, reassigned on or about July the 1st, 2014, you moved to the criminal bench. What, what, when I came from uh, Gatson to here? Yes. Oh, I came over in April. Okay. The and normal I, rotation would have been July, but for whatever reason, I was asked to come and replace Angela Dempsey. All right. Now, <clears throat> You have already described uh, what happened in your first week, and so we won't go through that again, but this is a docket that you inherited at that time. Is that correct? That's correct. When you came to uh, this county, was there any specific uh, training that you had to have uh, before you assumed the bench here in Leon County? Not, not criminal. That was my forte. Okay. Once you uh, arrived in Tallahassee and you, you were uh, uh, assumed the bench, how many years did you stay before this incident that we're here about today regarding your son? Um, I was there from that April 28th uh, uh, reassignment docket. I, I went on the bench after April 28th because uh, uh, that was just when I was supposed to physically be there. Then this situation with Justin happened July 31st or 30th, 29th. Um, and then they reassigned me August the 2nd. All right. Well, in regard to, you've already testified about what happened that night uh, regarding your son. Have you provided the information to this panel here today about uh, how you uh, found out, I don't think you have, about uh, what occurred that night. Okay. What happened was is that I, I was caregiver for my mother, and uh, she and I have been out our favorite store, the Goodwill. And I took my mother home, and I was, uh, we had been out shopping and eating and everything, and then I took her home to my father, and I went home, and it was, it was late, I went home, and I had gotten in the bed getting ready for my next day, my father called me and he was hysterical. He told me, something going on, okay, let me just say this. The house that this happened in was my, the house I grew up in. We call it the old family house, which was like one house down from where my parents built a new house, okay? And they could look out the window and see everything that's going on down there. So. My daddy called me and he's screaming and he said, there's something going on down at the house. You need to get over here right now. So I said, what's going on, daddy? And he goes, I don't know, something, something going on and they won't tell me nothing. So I came over there and I, my mom was there and um, my daddy was sitting outside and I said, well, what's going on, daddy? And they wouldn't tell me nothing. I, and obviously law enforcement wouldn't let me in the house. So I went up to each one of the officers and I said, um, what's going on? What is going on? And somebody said there's been a shooting. And I was like, a shooting? Okay, so then after that, uh, I'm running around, where's my grandson? 
and nobody could tell me where my grandson was. And where's my son? Nobody could tell me where my what, son was. What is your grand, grandson's name? Malcolm. How old was Malcolm at that time? About three. And how old? The only one I have. I'm sorry? The only one I have. And your son's name, I think you identified, is Justin. Yes. Do you have any other children? I have a younger son. His name is Alexander. All right. And does he also stay here in Tallahassee? No, he lives in Los Angeles. All right. Now, you told us about your parents. By the way, how, how old are your parents? My father's probably 89 and 90, 91. Okay. Now, once you talk to your father, was there a decision made by you to go to the, to the uh, police department? Well, what happened was is that he's telling me, I, he's, we want to know what's going on because it's his house. You know, it's, it's my family house, but it's his house. So then I went up to an officer. I said, can you please tell me what's going on? What happened here? They said, you can go down, you can find your grandson and you can find your son down at the Tallahassee Police Department. And I suggest you go down there. So I said, okay. So I went down there and I'm, you know, driving 30,000 miles an hour. I go down there and the first place they took me was to my grandson who, um, who uh, was with a female officer and I stayed with him and I tried to comfort him and I talked to him and everything. And then uh, once I was able to get up with his uh, mother to come and get him, I asked them, I said, where's my son? And they, before you go further, who is his mother? Christina Rosa. I called her to come get the baby. All right. Now, is that the same Christine Rosa, Christina Rosa that we have an affidavit on in this case? Yes, sir. All right. I believe that for purposes of the panel, her affidavit is number, number nine. Now, Ms. Rosa, and by the way, Ms. Rosa, did Ms. Rosa work in the courthouse here? In she Chicago? worked in the public defender's office. All right. And had she been working there at the time of this incident? Yes. All right. Now, when she's working at the public defender's office, does she have a badge and everything to go through? She's an employee of this courthouse, yes. All right. Now, let's go forward. You, you then went, you were at the, I believe we were there at the police department. Uh, you have uh, seen the video that's been played here today. Yes. Is, is that an accurate account of what occurred there uh, or were there other matters that took place before you went into that room? Were I there? mean, I, I sat outside the, um, the interview room and was you know, talking mess with Malafonte. Um, he was trying to calm me down because he and I had been friends for years. He was the chief commander or night commander, so he was basically trying to calm me down and talking things like, how you like being back here and stuff like that. So he and I were going back and forth um, with an evidence that he was trying to say, it's okay, Barbara, just 10 floors down. All right. Now, did it come a time as already, I think you've testified about that you were called, uh, you asked to see your son? I asked, I can't remember if I asked to see the son downstairs or upstairs, I can't remember, but I know I said, I wanna see my son. I need to see my son and what is going on with him. I have no idea, at this point in the game, the, where I grew up is in the hood. It's right up the street from the projects. High crime area, in fact, 04 has been deemed one of the highest crime areas in the state of Florida. At this time, I didn't know if there had been a burglary at that house, a shooting, I didn't know what the relationship really was going down there. Now, after I talked to Malcolm a little bit, I started understanding a little bit about what was going on. But anyway, um, I, I, I was like, I need to see my son. And they were like, you, the only way you're gonna see your son tonight, because he's a grown man, this is exactly what they told me, is you, if you were his lawyer. I says, well, I guess I am his lawyer because I need to see my son. Now, as we sit here today, have you, are you acknowledging, of course, that that is something that you should not have done uh, as you were a sitting circuit judge here in, in this county? Yes. Right. Do you, uh, have you also acknowledged for purposes of this record that that was in fact a violation of the judicial canons? Yes. 
you went in, I believe you've seen certain portions of it, of the video that we saw here yesterday. Uh, did, how long did this whole process last? We saw about 40, 45 minutes. Of I don't know how long he had been there or how long or anything, because I, I just, I was down with Malcolm, and then they brought me upstairs. But I think I was with this boy and uh, the officers about over two hours. I was exhausted. Now, once you, he concluded this statement, and of course, you made some comments uh, there while you were, as, as shown on the video, is that correct? Yes. To the officers. Did you also say certain things to your son during that time? He, what I said, I was, I wanted to get off, after I talked to my son off camera, I knew my son was telling the truth, and he didn't have a thing to hide. So I was trying to encourage this boy to tell it all, because you need to tell these people what happened. And so uh, I encouraged him. Now, if I'm shushing him, it's because he's off track arguing with the officer. And I'm like, settle down. He's hyperactive, like his mother is. But I'm telling him to settle down, Justin. Just wait, OK? I'm not telling him not to talk, because he had just stood there and gave a full litany of what had happened. When I'm trying to calm him down, it's because he's arguing with the officer, and I'm telling him, let me hear what Magda has to say. And then, there was, I will submit, there was one place in there I told him, that is not necessary. And that was when he started talking about, if I wanted to kill her, I would have killed her when she gave me an STD. At that point, I thought it was totally inappropriate for him to say this girl gave him herpes. It didn't have anything to do with anything. That's involving an STD. Yes. And you told him, is that the only time on that tape that you told him not to, to proceed or and answer any additional questions or provide any additional information about yes. any STD? Right. Other than that, I was shushing him because he was arguing with Officer Magnum. Right. But as far as argument or not, that is the only time <laughs> that you said, no, don't ask, answer a question. Right. Or do, you, don't need to ask, you don't need to say what you're fixing to say. All right. Did you do anything else in that room other than what was shown on that video here yesterday in, it, in it, any way to hinder the investigation of those, uh, the TPD on the night uh, that your son was arrested? I didn't believe I did because it was my mission for him to tell those people what happened. He needed to tell them that night. Um, uh, Judge Ruth asked a question yesterday about what Malcolm had said to me. Malcolm was in and out of that room all night long where the shooting occurred. And he was, uh, he, when I talked to Malcolm, because he's telling me, Nana, um, the dog pushed me down. And I was responding at one point in the interview when Magda, when Justin was trying to say it was self-defense, man. You mean to tell me somebody come into the, uh, I'm protecting my son, and he's going on and on. And it reminded me at that point what Malcolm had said to me downstairs. He said, Nana, the dog pushed me down. And then he said, Nana, the dog bit daddy. And that's what he said. And that's what the comment was in reference to. He wasn't there when the gunshot went through the door, which he better not have been there. But he wasn't there when that happened. But he was there to see the aggression of the dog, which is what Justin was talking about. All right. Now, <clears throat> other than the comments that you made and what we saw on this video, or is there anything else? that it significantly, that you believe it was significant, that occurred in that room on that night? No, sir. Now, once that night was over, well, before we leave that, why did you not call another attorney that night? Because they made it really clear to me they were not fixing to stop interviewing this boy. And I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to do. I really did. I wasn't in a relationship necessarily with Gary, and I really wasn't in a relationship with no criminal defense attorney like that because I'm on the bench. And they, 
attorneys shy away from judges. I have good friends who are attorneys, and they, when I come to their office, they look at me like I'm from Mars. So I didn't, I mean, I wasn't, think, I wasn't thinking all these things that you asked me through. To be perfectly honest with you, I really wasn't. I was just looking at my son from here to you in shackles in this situation. But in retrospect, that is something, uh, as you told this panel, that should not have occurred. Is your presence there? Yes. Well, not my presence, but my representation. Right, your representation. Now, after that night was over, when did you first, did you, who's the first person that you talked to at the courthouse about your uh, going to, uh, going to the jail that, that, uh, at TPD with your son? Jonathan Sersham. And when did you talk to Judge Schuster about this? I went in, I know I didn't go to work early in the morning because I was exhausted, but I believe I went in that afternoon to tell him I was devastated and I was very out of order. Um, I went to tell him what had happened. Right. I just went and told him what happened because I really didn't know what to do at that point, to be honest. Did he recommend at that time that you contact uh, anyone at JQC? He did. He told me Alex was a good uh, person to make contact with, that you know, he, you know, he tries to work with judges, so you need to call him. And I had talked to Alex before, Mr. Williams before, about a lawyer. And so I did have a little bit of a rapport with him before I called him. So um, a lawyer who had done something in my courtroom that was not, she lied to me. And I called him and was trying to get his uh, advice about what to do about that situation. So I had talked to Mr. Williams before. So when John, Jonathan Schurstrom suggested I do that, then I did. All right. And did you subsequently uh, submit uh, a request or form that uh, was provided to you uh, uh, indicating that uh, this was something that uh, occurred and needed to be uh, that you were reporting a violation. Yeah, Mr. Williams says, I need you to send me an email and tell me what happened, and I did. Right. Once that occurred, <clears throat> did you, were you aware that uh, Attorney Roberts was going to appear on your son's behalf the next, uh, on uh, the 31st? I had hired him, I hope he would. And had you been able to speak to Mr. Uh, Roberts at all before the end? No, I think I, I called him and I said, Justin had an issue last night and I told him what it was and I just left it at that. Because I didn't deal with this case anymore. All right. I couldn't stomach dealing with any of this, reading the police report or anything. Now, after uh, that night, did you... Were you in, in uh, your, at the courthouse on the 31st, that, uh, the, the day of the first appearance? No. Where were you? I was either home, but I wasn't in the courthouse. Right. Did you in any way tell your JA to appear at the first appearance on your behalf? I didn't know she was going, to be honest with you. I did not know that she was going. I didn't even know she knew about it, to be honest with you. And, and so, I don't know how she ended up there. I don't know if she called Gary. I don't know how it came about, but I, I didn't talk to Judy about this. Um, one of the panel members asked me, how would Judy know? It's because it was all over the news. It was on the CTV had it yeah. Yeah. all day, all night. After you find out, okay, who else was present at that uh, first appearance? My father, heard? which I knew uh, Gary would call Daddy because he, he's the one with the money. So he called Gary, uh, he called my father to get some money to bond Justin out if he got a bond. All right. Now, <clears throat> you indicate that you had no knowledge of that uh, appearance. Now, when is the next time there was a court appearance? No, wait, now, I know he was going to go to first appearance. The officers told me that, but I didn't know the dynamics of all these people and where they were and what they were doing. I didn't know that I didn't. I just didn't get involved. I knew my daddy was going. All right. Because he was going to be the bondsman. When did you find out that Judy had been to the first appearance? 
I don't know when I found out she had been to the first appearance. She may have told me. I don't know. Um, I don't know when I found out about that. Um, Jonathan was not the, uh, the person who told me because I, I didn't know at that point about this, this sitting at this desk thing. So I, 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 she may have told me. I don't know. Daddy told me. Somebody told me. All right. Now, there was a second appearance a few days later at a detention hearing. Were you aware that Judy would be appearing at that detention? I, I believe that I knew that she was going to go to that. Um, uh, uh, but I, like, again, I didn't know this up at the council thing. You know, she took her leave and she went. She never even came to work that day, so I didn't know anything. But I wasn't in town. I was in Valdosta. I had left. When did you leave Tallahassee? I left Valdosta the Sunday of the day before the detention hearing. And did you send any information to Judge Houston or through anybody else at the courthouse that you, you would be out of town beginning to suffer? I, I, sent, I, had, I sent a text to Grant Slayton. In the text, it, it was on the first. That's why it precipitated that e email that he sent to Lee on the second, early in the morning. At 1039, and I have a copy of the text, I text Judge um, uh, Mr. Grant, and I say, look, I have tried all night long to deal with this thing you gave me. It doesn't work, and I'm just really stressed out. He, and these were my words, and I can read it. I'm really stressed out. Uh, I need to see my son. I am leaving Tallahassee on Sunday to get away from this place, and I like to see my son. That's now, what the text was, and it was it went 10:39 August 1st. I looked at it this morning, and I have it now. This specific text. Do you know whether or not it was delivered? It says it was delivered on my phone. I have it. It's still in my phone. And that would have been to Grant uh, Slayton. Grant Slayton. Let him know that you were going out of town. I was leaving Sunday, and so I wanted to see my son, please. I need to see him. Right. And did you receive any message back from Mr. Slate? Nothing. No word, no nothing. The next, what, the next thing I received was a very, very aggressive phone call from Judge Shurstrom on August the 2nd saying, you basically, you deal with your situation. Grant Sladen or the court will not be involved in having, a uh, setting up anything with you and your son in communication between you and your son. All right. What kind of communication were you seeking with your son? I just wanted to talk to the boy and see him. I just wanted to see him. I didn't know if he was suicidal. I didn't know what was going on with him. Did uh, you subsequently find that once you were told that the court would not be involved in, uh, in efforts to see your son, did you contact anyone yourself? I, I called Major Lee and I think when Jonathan said that, he said that I said I would, wasn't going to use no phone call with no Polycon and PD. And I, that was a crazy response to me because neither one of those calls are monitored. So if I was trying to get unmonitored, they would be the, the calls that I would be trying to use, Polycon, because I use it in my practice, and PD. Those are, those are lawyer lines. So I wouldn't have said, I don't want no phone call with no Polycon and no PD because it didn't make sense to say that. But anyway, I told Jonathan, I said, Jonathan, I didn't ask Grant for any help. He came to me offering help. And so I said, I, I, thank you very much, and I hung up the phone. Then what I did, because Grant never came back to me. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm stressed. Now judge is telling me, I ain't helping you, I don't care. They're telling me, don't go to the jail. You cannot go to the jail. Bill Willis is telling me, no. You're going to tear up the security out there. They're on, no, you can't go to the jail like a normal parent. You can't do this uh, digital mess either. By the way, Judge, uh, once, do you know whether or not it, any uh, judge, whether it's you or anyone else, if, if they're involved in any issue, do they separate uh, those persons at the Leon County Jail for protected custody. Well, my son's in protected custody. Yes. Yeah. I mean, they normally send him to another jail, but um, Sheriff, because I was real concerned that night about him being arrested and put in jail, because I was on the felony bench, and what people out there that was mean 
to me. Um, and I guess I'm mean to them in their mind. But, but um, so after um, Jonathan told me, you go pound sand, I'm not helping you do anything. I reached out to Walt McNeil. I said, Walt. Now, who is Walt McNeil for purposes of this uh, He's a friend. He's a neighbor. Um, he lives the street over from where I live. But uh, him and uh, Gloria. Yes, but okay. who, would you tell us? Okay, he's a I'm sorry, he's a sheriff. Okay, so I said, look, I don't want to go out to this jail. I don't want to cause any problems. But I need to see my son. Please. I can't get, please. So he told me, he says, Barbara, um, I'm, I'm gonna, uh, I want you to reach out to Major Lee. He got a program, they got some kind of laptop. Um, and uh, Grant was kind of describing that and that's why I responded. I had never heard of this in my life in the 40 years I've been doing business that the inmates have laptops. I was like, they do? And they will talk to you with these laptops or something. And I was like, is that recorded? What's the deal with that, Grant? That's what I asked him, and that's what started all this stuff with Jonathan. But anyway, I called Judge, um, Walt McNeil, and I said, look, I don't want to start any problems out of this jail, but you know what? I'm comfortable at the jail. I'm going to the jail. I've been a criminal defense attorney all my life, and I'm very comfortable with the people at that jail. Um, he says, no, do not go out to the jail. I'm going to reach out to Major Lee. Major Lee will try to get that uh, digital whatever that they were doing, which never worked. Uh, up and running and see if you can talk to your son. So he called Major Lee and Major Lee called me. Somehow no, we hooked up, Major Lee and I hooked up. And then Major Lee tried everything he could do to get that, um, that thing to work for me and it wouldn't work, it just wouldn't work. And when you say that thing, are you talking about the system itself so that you would be able to communicate with Yeah, with this, because you do, they do, were able to do video <coughs> conferencing. Because the one that's working now, I actually send my son videos of his child on the one that works now good. Well, before we go further, uh, you, you've indicated the one that you have now. Now, your son actually got out on bond at one time, is that right, correct? Right, he did. Uh, but he's, he was subsequently violated the terms of his bond? Yes. And so he's back in the jail. Right. And you now have <clears throat> communication through a, a same kind of instrument that you were trying to get uh, service before. It's a little different. It's a different service, a provider and everything. They actually have a tablet, like an iPad, in their they own. I pay for it every month. Before, from what I understood from Major Lee, it was an iPad that was in the unit or some kind of computer in the unit. But Justin actually has something that he can go on the internet, take classes, he can um, go to the library, he, all kind of just whack stuff. I'm like, wow. I sent him emails, sent him texts. All right. Now, and that is, to your knowledge, something unique to Leon County? Uh, no, uh, Jack, none of the surrounding areas have this. It's something in, innovated by that sheriff. That sheriff has really. And that's Sheriff McNeil. Now, and did, was that made available? Did, were you able, did he give you some type of device initially that you had some problems working with? Yeah, that's the one that uh, somehow or another Justin wasn't able to do video conferencing with me on the old system because Major Lee went down in the unit to try to get it to work and he couldn't get it to work and they just threw their hands up. At this point, I was just out of gas. The system didn't work. I couldn't go to the jail. Now, eventually, uh, as you said, now you do have a device that does work the way that you would like to have it work when you were talking to the, uh, to the chief judge about this matter. Right. Did you ask for any preferential treatment in, in providing any kind of instrument to you so that you could contact your son that was not already in existence? I did not. I asked Grant when he was describing this thing at the jail, which I had never heard of, where an inmate has an iPad in the unit. That was new to me. I was like, go ahead on, Chief McNeil. Um, I was asking him, I said, what is this? Is this recorded? And the reason I'm asking is because I'm a public official. I don't want everything my mouth say in the public. It wasn't about my son, because my son had given a two-hour interview 
and he was telling the truth. I wasn't concerned about him, but I mean, I'm, and I, I just, I mean, I tell him personal stuff. It's being recorded. I'm a public official, so my concern was more about what I was going to say on that phone, and I've since had to curtail some of the stuff I want to say. For example, I did, there are inmates out there that I am still having problems with, and I have had death threats throughout my career. Um, I want to tell Justin's their names to look out for, but I don't do that. I just tell them to be careful. Okay. And the guards out there are really good about watching them. And then that works, the, the device that you have now works, and it's the same device, is it not, that is made available to other members of the public and their families out at the Leon County Jail. It's called Securitas, yes. It's a, it's a network, all of, the prisons have it now, I heard. And nothing was developed uh, to give you preferential treatment? No. Now, is that the same Major Lee that is going to testify here today, to your knowledge, that you, you've been referring to? Yes. All right. Let's move forward. Did you, uh, you heard some testimony yesterday from Judge Shustrom indicating that uh, he brought you in or attempted to bring you in for counseling? Yes. Do you recall that mm -hmm. testimony? Yes. Mm -hmm. Did you uh, resist counseling or did you attend? Which counseling for me? The counseling for, uh, well, first of all, for you. No, I did not. I, um, I was having some issues, and he could recognize that I was having some mental health issues, and so he um, recommended me to go to Mrs. Lattimore Judicial Wellness, and I did. Now, Mrs. Lattimore, is she down in West Palm Beach? Yes. And did you, at, uh, because you've been provided that information by Judge Shustrom, did you talk to uh, this? Uh, uh, Ms. Ms. Lattimore, Judge Lattimore, yes. And after talking to Judge Lattimore, um, did she provide some information that was she, helpful for you? She did, and she gave me, because my mama had died too. So she was trying to help me through the grieving process, and she was trying to help me with everything I was going through. Um, and I think Jonathan picked up what I was starting to have come apart. And so he did provide that information right. to you. Mm -hmm. right. Now, he also gave you, before we go to your JA, did he give you other things that you should not do in the form, I believe we've seen those exhibits, that counseling points that you should not, uh, uh, things that you should not do in, in, as far as involving yourself with your son's case. Right. Now, once he told you about those things, that he did not want you to, to do to, as far as being involved, did you follow those recommendations and guidance? Yes, I did, but I told Jonathan, Jonathan, I don't want nothing to do with this case. I can't even read the police report. Did you violate in any way once he told you, gave you the counseling points that he's already prescribed, told this, this uh, panel about yesterday, did you violate in any way those provisions? Nothing. Now, Let's talk briefly about your JA. There were points, then you recall that testimony from yesterday, regarding uh, your JA, Judy, were. Had you ever had any problems with Judy before this incident that took place during the time that she's been with you uh, uh, with disobeying any uh, uh, requirement that you've had in regard to the to uh, the the uh, system that you had developed for her. No, it all started with this mess with my son, and it just went. Now, when the judge uh, uh, actually brought the two of you in and talked to you and told you about those that things that he did not want you to do or her to do, rather that is going to first appearances, getting involved in any way in those cases. Did you counsel Ju Judy as well? I did. I said, Judy, just sit down. You know, really, I'm very spiritual. I said, God's got this, Judy. Just leave it alone. To your knowledge, after the date that Judge uh, Shustrom gave those counting uh, 
uh, those points. That was August the 12th, yeah. And how do you know it was August the 12th? Because I was gone. I left Tallahassee that Sunday and went to see a friend of mine in Valdosta on the Sunday after that Friday of the 2nd. I stayed gone that whole week to just get away. And Jonathan just kept telling me to get out of town. He says, you're, 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 you're coming apart, Barbara Lee. So I did. So from, I want to say, Sunday the 4th, the day before his detention hearing, to uh, the next Monday, I was out of pocket, which would have been the 12th when I got back, is when he called me to his office about having that meeting where he goes through those points. And then, um, because apparently she had been at council table on the 5th. All right. And you had no prior knowledge of that? No. When he called me on the 12th, it's the first time I got, I got gathered of all that stuff. Now, he sat up there yesterday. He talked about these talking points. Oh, he sat here yesterday and he went through the talking points. Well, I do believe in my heart that the talking points were part of the August 12th meeting between he and I and, J and that girl. Um, I'm sorry, I'm getting um, J Judy. So the, what I'm saying, the talking points, I believe in my heart was because I wasn't there from August the 4th, I left, actually I left that Sunday and I came back that next Sunday. So I didn't come back to the office until the Monday, the 12th. So the talking points that he's talking about, we didn't get to until that Monday because the last time Jonathan talked to me was on August the 2nd when he was very unhappy and said, no more help from the courthouse from you trying to get to see your son. No. And we didn't talk again after that. That was the last time? That's the last time him and I talk after August 2nd when he called me and then August 12th he, he called me to his office and he had all of that stuff ready for me to go. And me and Judy, I think both of us went. Went to his office. And he went through the talking points. And, and it was at that meeting that Judy made this comment to him. Did you... Uh, you said she made. A well, I, I, I believe I left. Well, maybe it was. No, no, that wasn't the meeting. Go on. All right. So now that uh, you had those talking points, did you go, go back to your office and talk to Judy about those talking points? Yes, I asked her. I said, just let it go. I mean, Justin will be fine. He will be fine. Right. There, I mean, when the facts come out, Judy, he will be just fine. Now, one of those fights uh, indicated that she should not have any contact whatsoever uh, with anything to do with anybody in this case involving your son. You remember that? Yes, sir. Now, without going through it, I want to make sure that the uh, panel, uh, the, the number of, we have a, an affidavit of Rosa, is that your, is that the mother of your grandchild? Yes, it is, Christina. And that is number nine uh, for members or purposes of the panel. And that is the affidavit from Rosa. Now, you, uh, Rosa, according to the former charges, came by your room. This would have been after Judge uh, Schuster had his talking points with you. What was the purpose of Rosa coming coming by your office? She wrote, uh, she worked upstairs uh, in the public defender's office. So Rosa was always there. If, she, if the baby was with her, she'd bring the baby to let me see the baby. She was always there. So she just she was just there. I didn't really know why she was there other than she just normally came to see me. Oh, and by the way, I didn't say that is the that is the exhibit for for the Hobbs exhibits. Exhibit number nine. I didn't, not the JQC exhibit. I'm sorry. I mean, it was not a pre-constrived meeting. When she came, she had her little papers uh, in her hand that she, I'm gonna file an injunction against her too, some, added, some statement like that she made. And then, um, if I recall, I don't, that's what she said, I, I got, I'm gonna file one too. Right. And were the documents in any way written by anybody in your office? 
Christina had wrote those documents. I didn't even know Christine was gonna do it. I didn't even know that, well, she, she told me something that I didn't even know until um, later on. I didn't know that, yeah, I guess I did, that uh, Jasmine had filed injunctions against Justin and Christine. And by the way, Judge, I don't know if we've heard this before, but the JQC uh, actually searched the computers of yourself as well as uh, Judy Ware, is that correct? I don't know if JQC did it. I mean, Jonathan and Grant did it. They searched my computers because he wouldn't believe that I wasn't doing anything. And I tried to tell him, Jonathan, I'm not doing these things you think I am. But the computers were, in fact, they searched. Were searched. All right. And to your knowledge, was anything retrieved from that search? Not to my knowledge, it shouldn't have been because there wasn't nothing in it. Once, now have we, once, uh, Rosa took the document downstairs to the clerk's office. Was there any other contact that she had with this case, to your knowledge? No, and you need to understand, I was duty judge that day, so I was, in it, I was looking at injunctions all day. So I wasn't sitting there waiting for Mrs. Uh, Ju uh, Mrs. Rosa to come in with her injunction. I didn't even know she had it. This was some tip for tat she was doing with this girl. Now, <clears throat> Subsequent to that, I think you've already been through, uh, we talked about through the questioning asked by counsel, what occurred uh, with Mr. Roberts. Did we give you an opportunity to tell specifically what happened with Mr. Roberts uh, when, when he came before you on those two cases? I think we've been through that. Yeah. Yeah. Now, your next uh, set of charges arose from uh, your JA and your failure to supervise your JA. Have we covered all of the information regarding sitting the failure to uh, properly supervise her regarding sitting at the council's table, uh, providing uh, uh, both sitting at the council's table on the first appearance and at the subsequent detention here. Have we covered yes, that? I think so. Now, as far as, and finally on that, uh, according to the former charges, have we also covered uh, the security badge? No, I just want, what I understand, that what happened with the security badge is this. Okay, so my mother died. She died. August 27th, and she, she was still, she had, she was carrying my father on her health insurance. And he had gone to Publix to get his blood thinners. And he couldn't get his blood thinners. They said, you ain't got no insurance. My father was very, very upset. So he blew my son's phone up, as they say. He just called him about what is going on with this. And I, I submitted documentations in the, um, my response to the investigative panel showing that where they were canceling my daddy's health insurance. I didn't know I had to fix it because I didn't know, and it makes sense, she's dead, she's not getting paid no more, so ain't no money coming out of account. So we had to set up something where they started taking it out of his retirement. But anyway, so Justin didn't know I was out of town because I hadn't talked to the child, and neither did Daddy, really. I was just going to go down to JQC in Orlando for the day. I rode down early in the morning, and I was coming back. I didn't spend the night. I never did talk to the, uh, him or Daddy about it. So Justin is trying to bring this stuff up here to me because Daddy is all over him about his health insurance because he didn't know I wasn't there. So. From what I understand, Ms. Ware, with her bursitis, gave him her badge, and he went down to the garage to go outside the side door to his truck to get the papers that I needed to fix my father's insurance and bring it back up to me. And that is how this all, the badge and him doing that. Dead wrong, she should have got up and took him down there. She should have told him I'd go out the front door. 
she should have did what, but that's how it came about, is the boy was bringing me stuff that my father sent him, his notice of cancellation, and his cancellation from um, the Publix to let me know that his insurance had canceled. So I- Were you in any way aware, uh, Judge Hobbs, that your son was going to uh, use a badge, that badge through your assistant? I didn't even know the boy was coming to the office because I hadn't talked to him about it. And, and I didn't, when Jonathan Shersham told me that this had happened, I said, where was I? He says, you weren't even here. I said, where was I? He said, you were down with JQC. So I didn't know anything about it. I had gone down like five o'clock in the morning and to try to get back before dark. Do you acknowledge before this panel that that action as far as that was taken by your judicial assistant was in fact wrong to provide that security badge to your son? If anybody is scared of security issues, it is a judge, especially a judge who gets death threats on a regular basis. So absolutely. And finally, the, the final area is in regard to these three cases that uh, You've been charged uh, with not providing timely orders in these three cases. Now, first of all, the, the first case is Pittman versus Smith. Do you have that in front of you, Judge? What, which this is on page four of no, seven. Which, which exhibit? No, well, I'm looking at the, the which is exhibit. It? I want to make sure I, I got, I'm, 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 I'm talking about them right. Maybe, I This, well, look at number nine. Okay, I got, I got them, sir. I got them. You have them? Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. What exhibit number is it? Exhibit J number nine. J J C exhibit? Yes. Okay. And that is referred to as the amended. This is uh, number nine, the amended notice of former charges. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. February 19, 2021. Okay. You want me to go down them? Yes, let's okay. first of all talk, talk, talk uh, tell us, uh, Paola, about Pittman versus Smith. Were you involved in that case? Yes, I was involved as just a judge who had the title on, who had the name on the, you know, even though cases are before the magistrate, every, there's a judge assigned to it. So, yes. All right. Now, did you sign any emergency order before you left town? As relates Not, to that case? What, Pittman and Smith? Yes. No, that's, no. Uh, you want me to tell you? Yes, that? tell okay. us, please. So, the Pittman case, was already before uh, Don, not Don, the local Johnson, um, the magistrate. It was before the magistrate because she, um, the the um, the father and the mother had been going back and forth with this over this child's um, counseling. So she has set a hearing for September the 29th. I saw in the file. And then she subsequently set another hearing for October 4th. But she was dealing with the same issues. The dad is saying they're not taking the child to um, counseling, and the mother is trying to question the necessity or need of counseling, something like that. So that's why you got this uh, 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 September 19th court uh, emergency hearing, and then a September 20th expedited hearing, because they are fighting. So the magistrate had the case, and there was a referral that she was to deal with all issues associated with this case. And that was in the file that the magistrate? Yeah, it was, I mean, you can see it in the record of the proceedings, and I always go through the docket to see the history of what's going on. And she had the case, and she was setting it for hearing, and she was litigating the case when the emergency came in. She had a hearing set for, I believe, the 29th, and one set for October the 4th on essentially the same issues. So. I didn't know or think that I had to deal with the case because the magistrate is doing it. And that, I guess this is where education on that, I didn't realize I got to say on a piece of paper, non-emergency, for her to conclude it, because she ended up dealing with it anyway, September the 29th and the 4th. She did, she said that uh, 
that because the circuit judge had ruled on the emergency motion, she couldn't directly deal with it, but she believed all issues associated with the emergency hearing had been dealt with. I think she did that uh, at her 29th hearing and her fourth hearing in her final order. So I'm looking at it, it's, uh, the, the litigants are before the magistrate. Hearings are set to go on the 29th. Hearings are set for the October 4th. So when the emergency came in and it's just dealing with dad saying, mom refused to take the baby to counseling, I just allowed it to stay with the magistrate for her to litigate and make findings of facts and conclusions of law and send them to me. And that's where you left this particular file? When you with the magistrate. Yes. Where, did you go out of town at that point? Well, no, I had just gotten back from mother's funeral, um, <coughs> mother's uh, burial on the, um, around about the 13th, 14th, or 15th, somewhere in there. So I had just gotten back when it came in. Did you believe that you was necessary for you to issue another order determining whether or not the motion qualified as an emergency? No, I didn't believe it because, as I said, I can't even remember the magistrate's name right now. She just ran for judge. Um, she, was, she had hearings set. When I looked in the computer, she had hearings set on the same issues. Is there anything else about that case that we have not covered that you want to tell this panel about? Well, after talking to the magistrate and finding out, well, Judge, even though I'm dealing with the same issues, I've got hearing set, you still got to write on here non-emergency for me to address it. So when I, after I talked to her and she told me that, I, I, I went back in and October 21st, I said uh, not an emergency. Is that a, well, uh, actually I didn't, I'm sorry, because I didn't do it. She had dealt with the case, so the case had shut down at that point. So as it said, as of 21st, you had not issued an order because the case was closed. Is that one of those unwritten procedure rules that, that Leon County had at that time? About the how, and it, it doesn't even tell you how to tell folks you, it's non emergency. Um, Jonathan says he writes it on a piece of paper, other people got stamps, all kind of varied ways that they communicate it's non emergency. And my, I just looked at the case is being litigated, it's being moved. When did it come up? Were you out of town when the matter came up regarding this particular hearing? Not, well, no, not this case. All right. The next case, Mr. Riley case, I Tell was, um, mother had died on the 27th. Um, the way she died was very traumatic for me. I mean, she was, I mean, she was old, I submit, but she just fell up. I mean, I went over to the house to take her some food and she was just sitting in her chair dead. She had just fallen off into uh, death in her sleep. And I wasn't expecting this, so I'm totally torn up. So I don't function. I don't function for about 10, 15 days after that. I mean, I literally, my mother was my best friend. She was my, I was her caregiver, so I'm just totally messed up. Were you in town uh, when this matter came up? The I was incident? here, I was here, I was here because we were planning. I picked out of her casket and all this, you know, bought her funeral plot. So I was doing all that stuff at home. Had you taken leave yes. uh, from, from Jonathan, the Yeah, because Jonathan, uh, I don't mean to disrespect him, Judge Shurstrom, he and Tanya Monks, they got me senior judges to cover my trials and all of my dockets. So there was a senior judge and you've got it in your exhibit somewhere. A senior judge came in to cover all my stuff because I had trial set. Was your understanding that senior judges were supposed to cover when you were out during that time frame? That's what I saw Judge Reynolds doing. He was sitting in the lawyer, excuse me, judge's office that was out, signing papers and doing all of that judge's work. And that is why I, they were there to help me because I was gone. Now who is Judge Reynolds for purposes? Judge Reynolds is a retired judge who comes in. He was my mentee judge. Um, when I first came a judge, and he's a retired judge, he's been a judge for 30, 40 years. This is in reference to uh, Hobbs exhibit number eight, labeled senior judges.
Now, Now, does that, the senior judge yeah, provision. I'm not sure that's the right exhibit number. Number, did I say eight? You yeah. said eight. I've got the Constitution of the state of that's, Florida. That's in front exactly, of me. there is no order. It is, that is exactly the provisions are under the Florida Constitution, Article okay. 5, which we did not attach to. Section okay. All right. Thank you. But, that's what we're but there, there's a list of the senior judges that were covering me. And who is that, where is that list? Oh. Is it eight? No. Nope. I don't think we listed it. To your knowledge, uh, during that time, you, there were senior judges, and you said one of them is Judge uh, Reynolds? Yeah, they, but they, there, were, there were specified judges who were brought in that week and the next week to cover all my stuff. Judge Francis was brought in to do some trials. Um, Judge Reynolds was brought in. They were brought in specifically to cover my diets. And, and you told the chief judge that you would, would be out for a couple weeks? He knew I was out. I mean, they came to my mother's funeral. So he knew. All right. Now, after, <clears throat> I think, do you have anything else that you would like to say regarding this, that case in the interest of Jacqueline Riley as to what happened with that emergency uh, order while you were out of, uh, uh, out of place for that two weeks? After I got, okay, N no. The last one is uh, Cameron Woods and Cadiz no Noel. All right, as to the Cameron Wood and Cadiz Noel, tell the panel exactly what occurred before you left and where did you leave this case? Okay, so when this came in, I declared it an emergency um, on the 21st and then I ultimately got out, I ultimately left. Um, the uh the left the office um and then let me see left the office okay and i had declared it before i left on the 21st an emergency somehow another judy and Rhonda were talking and that's why if you look on I, mr mr knows okay mr randolph Yes. Okay. There's an exhibit that has uh, the court docket filings. Do you know what exhibit that is? Court docket filings. Like the entry of all the doc of the documents that were uh, everything that was filed in that case. Mr. Chairman, I approach the witness. There's a. This is not. Uh, it is a document relating to what occurred on August the 29th, 2019, but I don't think that it is a part of the record. Hang on, show it to Mr. Williams. Yes. yes. Right. And this will be references uh, respondents exhibit A for identification. Yes. Oh, okay. All right. Yes, this is the uh, coverage uh, that was had uh, by the senior judges, Judge Reynolds, Judge Francis, Judge Sherstrom on Friday uh, while I was out with my mother trying to um, bury her. Exhibit number 
eight with these two documents. All right, any objection? Objection. Make it exhibit yeah, number let's 18. Let's make it number 18, it'd be easier. So it'd be admitted as respondents exhibit 18. Counsel, if I understand, that's that's the list of the judges that we're covering for that's her? That's correct. Thank you. That would have covered the days when I was out that this emergency hearing came in. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. All right. All right. So I was talking to you about Mr. Cameron Woods. Okay. So when I left uh, August 21st, I declared Mr. Woods a emergency. Then Judy and Mrs. Um, Rob, Miss um, Harris, they were talking and they re, they re, they found out or they realized that the respondent in this case had never been served by the petitioner and you can't move forward with these cases unless the respondent obviously is given notice of a hearing. So it was my understanding that Rhonda told Judy that it needs to be declared a non-emergency in order for uh, there, there to be time to locate these people. So if you look at exhibit number um, 16 of uh, Hobbs exhibits, you'll see um, a printout of the docket on this case. And if you look at it, you see the uh, on, it says 821 2019 instructions from the judge per judge set for emergency hearing. The next entry is a letter to Mrs. Wood, Wood Whittington from the case manager. The case manager is writing Mrs. Whittington and telling, and it, I don't know if the letter is in here, but she's telling her we can't do nothing in this case until such time as the respondent is served. Judge Hobbs cannot, well, actually it is in, it's in that composite exhibit. It's a letter dated September 23rd, 2019 to Sherry Wood Whittington, who is the petitioner in that case. Do you have the exhibit number? Yes, sir. It is, um, it's exhibit 16. And if you keep flipping back, like before you get to 17, there's a letter from the Office of Court Administration and it's addressed to Shirley Wood Whittington, dated September 23rd. Date stamp 10. What, date stamp, Mr. Bait stamp 10. 10. Exhibit 16, bait stamp on the bottom right, 10. Thank you. Now, what does that indicate? Uh, they, they, the, the, they can't do anything. I can't do anything with this case until the respondent is served. And so Judy and Mrs. Harris were going back and forth on how to get this done while I was kind of like in and out. So on September the 23rd, consistent with what her supervisor told her to do, is she sent a letter to Mrs. Whittington and said, we can't do anything with your um, case until there's personal service on the respondent. The non-emergency was put in place because it wasn't any uh, Emergency, emergency. I call emergencies blood on the floor, as Judge Brown was used to tell me. But um, it wasn't emergency, emergency. It was something I was going to deal with. Okay. And I, I try to. I don't. I try to let everything be emergency. If there is an emergency to a um, to a citizen, it's emergency, even though it's kind of not an emergency. But anyway, she sent this letter out telling we can't move forward until Mr. the respondent is served. And so um, I, I deemed it a non-emergency so that that process could get done when I got back uh, on about the 14th or the 15th of September. When I sent it down or when Ms. Ware sent it down, the clerk's office, for no good reason, and we still are not able to determine today, parked it in a correction queue. Now you said she parked in a correction queue. This is exhibit number, is that reference in exhibit number 16, the letter from the Leon County Clerk of Court, Gwen Marshall? Right. Is that it? Number 16. 
And that letter basically was a letter to the JQC acknowledging that her office had made a mistake and that they were putting corrective mat, uh, issues in place to try to fix this, uh, put parking things in the queue like that without really letting the judge know that they're in the queue. Because I don't have a clue that it's not, it's, it's in this correction clue. Ms. Ware says she didn't get an email regarding it, but Rhonda knew it was in the queue. But she, she couldn't see, she couldn't see the non-emergency to move forward with getting the respondent served. Is that, I, I think I said 16 is 17 right. for mm -hmm. purposes of the record, number 17. And so this is the letter that the clerk acknowledged that their office had made a mistake as regard to this case. Correct. So then they couldn't find it in the queue. They didn't see it on the docket. So I was either out of the office dealing with my father or something, and Judy says, Judge, that thing is not in the computer. And Rhonda needs it in the computer to move forward and try to get these people, you know, help for us to get these people served. So I said, well, Judy, send another one down. And she did. And that's what the BKH was at my instruction, because I'm not in the office. I'm asking her to deal with it and just put it and send another one through. That one showed up in the clerk's website, which is what was needed. When I got that and I got this uh, thing from um, this complaint, I think I may have filed another one. I'm not sure if I did, but that's why the BKH is there because I'm out of the office and the one I sent down there earlier is gone and it's not in existence. They can't find it because it's in the queue, the correction queue. Right. So I asked when, you know, you know, you really should fix this. And she says, I'm sorry, and we will. But that particular case, there were several errors, but the, the error that caused the problem uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, is the error that the clerk of court had made. They put the non-emergency in a correction queue so Rhonda and Judy couldn't see it <coughs> to move forward. They needed it to be in a non-emergency status, from my understanding, for Rhonda to send it to the magistrate by getting his people served and everything like that. Does the letter from the clerk, that's exhibit number 17, indicate that they would correct that problem so that this yeah, would not she, did. she said she would do something to make sure that the case manager and Ms. Ware were aware of what was going on so he didn't just sit out there and, and know. I mean, it was sitting in emergency status when um, the uh, complaint came through, but it wasn't supposed to be an emergency. It was in a funny place. Now, have we covered what happened as to why there was no action in that particular case on behalf of yourself? Yes. Now, this is the same case, is it not, <clears throat> uh, Judge Hall, that led to the charges made in regard to the, uh, uh, to Ms. Harris. Is that correct? Yes. Would you tell the panel <clears throat> exactly what happened uh, when Ms. Harris came by at, because of your request to your office. <clears throat> okay, okay I'm, I'm sorry. Okay, so um, um, when I got the complaint from, this is the first time I realized these cases are a problem when I got the complaint. So I'm totally confused as to what is going on. You say complaint. Are you talking about the complaint from the JQC? The complaint or an investigative something. something investigative panel. In. Okay, so I called Rhonda over and I, she didn't see the whole document because it was just laying on the desk. And for reference purposes, I was just going down the list asking her, do you know what happened with this? What's up? What? And I didn't know. And she's explaining to me what the problems are. When we got to Cameron case, it is Rhonda who helped me discern that it was Gwen's office that had placed this thing in a queue, because otherwise I wouldn't have been able to figure it out. But when she says, Judge, listen, it's not in uh, non-emergency status, I would say, what? Because we had the paperwork where Judy had sent it down. But it was, she could, Rhonda couldn't see it, Judy couldn't see it, and I was like, I don't get what, what's up with that. And she said, apparently it went into a queue of some sort, Judge. So that's when I called Gwen up, 
because Rhonda left and Gwen came up and we talked about it at that point. But um, I'm asking Rhonda because she's my case manager, a, a gosh darn good one, and she's, she was telling me about all this stuff and trying to explain to me this is what happened, this is what happened, this is what happened. And, you know, and to her credit, I may have been a little aggressive because I'm confused. It's like, I don't get this. Why are these here? Um, and so she explained it to me. And then I looked up to her because when I left to go to my mother's, you know, death and funeral and everything, she and Judy were, they were the best of friends in my guesstimation. I mean, so much so that Judy had this bursitis that Ronald would actually give her some, her, some medication to help her with her knee. Um, and I just looked, I said, Rhonda, did Judy say this to you? Because I'm trying to figure out what the deal is. Because, you know, I'm, Rhonda and I were getting along. I thought she and Judy were getting along. We were all one big family. It was a good fit for me. Rhonda, because Rhonda would help me with everything. She would tell me, I mean, I could go to her. I mean, one time I went to her and asked her to help me learn how to do child support guidelines, and she ran it and she explained it to me, because I didn't even know how to do that. Um, but Rhonda was such a good source for everything for me, and so I, I was kind of like taken aback that Judy would say this, and so I said, did she really say that to you? And, you know, Judy is maintaining she did, and Rhonda said she did, and I'm just like, okay. All right. Did you say anything else to Miss Harris, who appeared here yesterday, to make her feel uncomfortable other than what you told this panel today occurred? No, I wouldn't. Didn't and wouldn't. Did you in any way try to threaten her or her job? No. Did you, were you aware that she was being moved? I uh, was, to? When I found that she was moved, being moved, I was very upset that they she was being moved. I had no idea why she was being moved, only to later find out it was already in place. But I, I had no idea why she was being moved because I didn't think Rhonda was that upset with me that she would ask to leave me. Right. So you find out yesterday for the first time that Rhonda had already uh, planned was to in move the mix in the process anyway. of moving? Yeah. Basically. Yeah. Is there anything else about that case that we have not already covered that you would like this panel to know? Now, we spoke quite a bit yesterday, and counsel has questioned you about uh, this training. And I do want to give you an opportunity. You've heard the testimony about training. Have you ever had any training as a judge uh, in the Southern Judicial Circuit when you went into family law? I hadn't had any training, um, but because it's really on the job training. It really is. That's how you do it in the Second Circuit in family law. You'll ask any judge, they'll tell you that. But I don't, the training or lack thereof has nothing to do with these emergency hearings. These were simply... Right. But on the training issue, you, you haven't had any formal training. I had, training. but after this, because that, that emergency thing that the magistrate, I, I had to find out how that worked. Um, because I didn't realize that even though the magistrate has the case, she's dealing with the case, she's going to litigate with the litigants, I didn't realize that because I didn't say somewhere non-emergency, she could move forward. And she told me at that time, she's no judge, you got to say it somewhere for me to take it, even though I got it. All right. Okay. Might have one more. Here I have no further questions. All right, we'll take a 15 minute recess and come back for pause. Thank you.
Uh, Mr. Williams, you may proceed with cross-examination. Thank you. Uh, I will be very brief. Uh, Judge Hobbs, I want to refer you to the uh, Respondent's Exhibit 18, which was the new exhibit, if you would. I'm sorry. I'm trying to talk in this thing, okay? Understood. But Respondent 18. That's correct. That was the new exhibit that Mr. Randolph brought to your attention. Yes, you're talking about the judge's, um, the senior judge's thing? Yes, ma'am. Okay. If you would, t tell us again what dates that was for. Do you have the emails in front of you by any chance? No. Oh, Miss Ross has it. The week of 9396. Those were the dates that you were uh, going to be out? For this, this, this week, but I was yes. out subsequent to that as well. Understood. And there were senior judges available to cover the, the regular hearings and things? Is that right? Right. Okay. Um, if an emergency hearing came, or a motion came in during that period, would it not be up to your judicial assistant who was in the office to bring that to the senior judge? She or Mrs. Harris, yeah. Excuse me, Judge, yes. would you pull the mic over to your pull a chair so you can be more comfortable so we can hear you, I okay? Mean, I, I know I'm real soft-spoken, except when I'm talking to my grandson, but... Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And turn it down. You can turn it down. Okay. 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 Right. Okay. okay. All right. Okay. All right. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, I have two exhibits that I would like the panel to take judicial notice of. Uh, they are two administrative orders uh, from the Second Judicial Circuit. <clears throat> Can I provide a copy to the chair after Mr. Randolph has had a chance to examine? Yeah, let, let him look at it first. Let me hear if there's an objection. I'm sorry, did you ask to provide it to Judge Hobbs? No, not yet. I'm okay. waiting for Mr. Randolph. Right, is there any objection to the... Uh, I have no objection. As opposed to taking judicial notice, do you, have, uh, do you wish to have introduced any evidence just so we have it in the... Sure. At this point, I'll, I'll move that they be uh, entered as uh, exhib uh, Exhibit 31. One and 32. 32. Okay. Ms. Ross will put us straight. <laughs> um, may I approach with the copy? Yes, you may. Two Judge Hobbs, your term in office when you were first elected to the bench began in January of what year? 13. January of 2013, and you were initially put into the family division, is that correct? Yes, sir. All right, would you look at the first document, the first administrative order, 2012-08? Do you see that? Yes. Okay. And if you would, I'm sorry, if, yes, if you would, 
uh, flip to the second page. It's a three-page document. Mm -hmm. Under number two, it says uh, Circuit Judge Barbara K. Hobbs. Um, and your assignment there starts with first 40% of all family division cases, uh, assuming the caseload from Judge Tamayo. Is that track with your recollection? Yes, sir. All right. And how long were you in that division? I was physically in there probably about, let me see, until I went to Gatson in July 2014. Okay, so that's more than the three month time period that you testified you were in family division for. I testified I was there at least a solid year. A year, okay. Um, would you take a look at the second document? That's the Administrative Order 2012-08 Third Amendment. Okay. And if you would turn to the third page, under number four, it says Circuit Judge Barbara Hobbs, Division D. Do you see that? Yes. And it says 40% of all family division cases. Do you see that? Yes. Okay, and if you would turn to the very last page, I believe it's numbered five, but it, I think it's on. Uh, it has Judge uh, Charlie Francis' um, signature. Do you see that? Yes, sir. Okay, and the day on that is May 2nd, 2013. So that would have been. Uh, your assignment until you transferred to Gadsden County in what year? July of 2014. Okay. Thank you. I don't have any other questions. All right. Could I have the exhibits? Please. No questions on that? All right. Let's go ahead and go to panel questions. Uh, Ms. McIver. Judge Hobbs, I've already asked you all the questions I have. I have no f questions for her. Yes, sir. No further questions. Thank you, ma'am. Good morning. Um, as a layperson, I might ask a few questions for you that are just kind of clarifying, trying to just thoroughly, as, as, as fully as possible, understand some of the procedures and processes that go on. Um, you had mentioned that you were not aware of the status of a few of the cases that, that we've discussed, the ones that are at issue. Um, can you explain for me how those are handled and who holds their, like, how, what's the process for making sure that those cases are moving and that the next steps are happening um, in the offices? How, how, how does that work? I, I don't fully understand how that workflow happens. Okay. Everything that comes in to me, everything, emergency hearings, there's copied Judy Ware and Rhonda Harrison everything that comes in so that they will be on notice for lack of a better word that I got something and either one of them can move something forward because she's my case manager he, she's my JA but I will submit that the primary responsibility probably should lay with the JA but the uh, case manager gets to email everything I get and has the ability to go in and make notes to make sure stuff don't drop through the crack. Okay, and then when an emergency, when, some, when an order is designated an emergency, who is responsible for serving and notifying the parties? It depends on the status. If the status is an emergency, which implies we're supposed to have a hearing real quickly, um, it's the judge. If the if the uh, if the if it if it has been deemed a non-emergency and it's pro se litigants, then it goes to the case manager because it's going to the magistrate. So in the um, Wood Noel case, when it was originally deemed an emergency, would it have been your office or your Is judicial assistant who would have been responsible to for try to set up a hearing? Okay. Yes, um, but. But typically, we don't try to set up hearings on pro se litigants. Um, it is the lawyers that we try to set up. So she goes to the case management. Because typically, the pro se cases go to the magistrate anyway. They don't stay with me as a general rule. OK. Um, looking at the, uh, the situation with uh, Attorney Roberts, can you think of any other examples of times that you may have recused yourself from cases? Uh, 
Um, there was a man in Gadsden County, his name is Hayes. He, I was, uh, uh, I never represented him, but I knew him pretty good in his family. I recused myself um, of that case because I didn't think I could, I, I didn't want to deal with it. Um, a man was doing work at my house, came in front of me, I recused myself because it was, it's not, it wasn't like a, a, a referral, I mean a J, DPA, it was me dealing with it. Any more cases that I can think of? I tried to ref do. Okay, so there was a, a allegation brought before the investigative panel dealing with a young lady, Miss um, Gray, and um, she filed a standing motion to have me removed from all of her cases because she was a complainant. I did, everyone. Your strike, that's confidential information. Okay. Okay, well, I, okay. I will sustain the objection. Ma'am, just wait for, the, Ms. Judge Hobbs, wait for the next question. No, sir. Yes, sir. I'm trying to think. Well, just wait for the next question. Okay. 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 I, I, I can't think right now. Okay, thank you. Um, if you had notified the uh, the clerk, I, I guess that's who you would have notified. If you if you were going to notify to recuse yourself from the cases involving um, Attorney Roberts, how what would that have resulted in? Would those cases have not shown up on your docket that day? I don't know the answer to that question because it's not something that is done. I don't have the answer to that question. It's not something that I know of in the history of my being on the bench of you doing that okay. by any judge. Okay. Um, uh, switching topics a little bit. Sorry, I'm going to bounce around. They're all no kind of... Um, uh, Chief Judge uh, Showstrom had noted... Um, in his documents that have been submitted, uh, both a uh, the conversation with you that I think occurred, uh, that you've acknowledged occurred the day after your son's arrest, maybe in the afternoon, and then also a phone call with you on August 2nd, which I, you also acknowledged occurred. In his notes on both of those, he does reference discussing with you, your judicial assistant, having appeared um, at the council table at first appearance. Do you recollect whether that's accurate, that that was brought up during those two conversations? No, I don't. Um, I don't. I, I don't think I got that information from him. I think it either came from my father or I don't believe it came from him at that point. Okay. So in both of those notes, he does mention that he had a concern with her appearing, but you don't recollect having had mm -hmm. that conversation with him either of those two times? No, mm -hmm. Okay. And um, with, uh, with Ms. Rosa, and, and I realize that this was a while, a while back, so you may not recollect, do you have any idea they provided us with a document showing where the clerk, Ken Kent, had come to and from your office that day? following Miss Rosa being in your office, do you have any idea why he would have been coming to and from your office? Yes, I do, and um, he's here, so he'll be able to tell you too. Okay. Okay, but he, he um, I was a duty judge. My job was to uh, um, deal with all the injunctions that were coming in, okay? And Judy was having some kind of problem with either e-filing them or something. Something was going on with the ability to get him back to the clerk's office. Ken, Mr. Kent came up there to help her, to show her, make sure she understood what she was doing and how to do it. And he brought, because uh, I don't think he brought me the injunctions because they would have come through the email, but he would have been taking paperwork back down because she couldn't e-file it. Okay. Um. Last, last, last grouping. During your son's arrest, understanding that this would have been a very stressful, um, stressful time, 
can you uh, just explain a little bit what you were thinking when you um, asked for the audio to be, to, when you came into the room, you made a statement about making sure that the audio had been turned off, um, implying that that's a privileged conversation since you were stating that you were acting his, his, as his attorney. Would that, would you have received that same privilege had you just been there as a family member? Meeting with him. I, I don't believe I would have. Um, I, I don't know for sure. Somebody else asked me that because I've never dealt with this place in the arrest process in my career. I've always dealt with the um, after the jail situation. But I would imagine that if a mom or a sister or brother was the normal person coming in there, they wouldn't have done it. But I don't know how they would have got in there anyway. There's no circumstances that I know of. Law enforcement would have let anybody in there but a lawyer. And so I, so I understand that day you really wanted to see your son, but in acting, I mean, you were, well, were you relatively taking it seriously that you were acting as his lawyer? Truth be told, I, I wasn't thinking. All I know is that my son it's been, he's here. And I would have walked over hot coals to get to my son. Okay, I understand. Um, I, that's all that I have for right now. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Shafina. Very briefly, I wanna discuss these two cases that we talked a lot about, the recusal cases. And I wanna make sure I'm clear in my mind and that we're all clear in our minds about what policies are in place here in this circuit. In some circuits, and we've heard from my colleague to my right in his circuit down in the Palm Beach area, they have procedures in place where you can tell the clerk of court, so-and-so judge any cases filed by that judge are not to be assigned to me, okay? Do they have that here in this circuit? No, sir. Okay. So even if you had wanted to have a particular, whoever it was, whether it's Mr. Roberts or whomever, that pro procedure doesn't exist here. And they wouldn't have done it. Okay. Now, the two cases in question, all right? When Mr. Roberts came before you, they were on a, a week apart, a couple of weeks apart, do you remember? Um, one was um, May 29th. Okay. And the other one was June 12th, okay. uh, 10th, 10th or 12th. I can't remember which day it was. Fairly close, okay. These were your dockets though, is that correct? I, I was a little confused or were they, were you subbing in for someone or no, had you just taken over I just dockets? took it over, Miss, Judge Dempsey, whatever reason the judge didn't think she should be on an active docket like that was transferred to Silbo because she was running and so I was brought back to Tallahassee and I was put on that docket. Okay. So the first one, the May 29th one, it's a cattle call and the lawyers on this panel are all familiar with what that is. All of a sudden, it, Mr. Roberts comes to the podium. Okay. In that particular case, the first one, what was it? Was this a note, an NP I think you referred to it as? Which, which was DPA. it? DPA. DPA. And what does that stand for? Defer prosecution agreement. All right, I don't practice criminal law. Okay. okay. What it is, you want me to it, tell you? No, no, you explained it before. That's a contract between the state and the, uh, the defendant. Right. Right, okay. Basically, if you do 10 things, Mr. Defendant, we'll drop the charge. Okay. Now, you mentioned that you didn't have anything to do in that particular case because they had made an agreement. But is there anything you do in connection with speedy trial, a waiver, anything? In the DPA situation? Yes. No. Okay. You don't touch it. It's, it that's the state and the defendant are dealing with each other. No, right. I do nothing. All right. Mr. Roberts was there. The state attorney was also there. They came up together. Okay. And the second incident was what? This was, you mentioned, a continuance? A continuance. They okay. came up together again and said, yeah. Who came up together? The state and Mr. Roberts came up and said, we need to just continue this for 30 days. 
Was there any discussion on that particular occasion about waiving speed of trial, anything like that? No, sir. They had had an agreement between them? Yes, sir. Any argument between the two as to the no. continuance? No. Okay. No further questions. Thank you. Yes, sir. All right. Let me. Um, still good morning. Good morning, Judge. Well, let me follow up on those recusals and let's talk about the Ponder case with the con continuance. Uh, I think yesterday you used the word pass, but that'd be a continuance. Right. Okay. Now, would you agree that it's, it does matter if the state moves for the continuance or the defense moves for continuance? Would you agree that makes a yes, difference? Yes, Because if the state moves, th there's no waiver of speedy trial, but if the defense moves, there's a waiver of speedy trial. Right. All right. And also, even if both parties agree to continue the case, would you agree that you don't have to continue the case? I mean, I guess I, I have the I, very unlikely I would because they're telling me essentially we ain't ready, but no, I don't. Right, but as a judge, you're right. responsible for your docket, and you can, you can say this case has been going on too long. I'm not going to continue the case. Yes, sir. So your decision to continue the case was a judicial decision. Would you agree with that? Yes, sir. I guess if, I mean. Right. And also, you scheduled it for a certain date. You scheduled it, for, I believe, September sometime, so about two, three months away. Um, if they knew that you had a, a uh, conflict, would you, and you had disclosed that, would you agree it would not have been scheduled on your docket for that time? I'm sorry. Would you agree that if you had disclosed that you had a conflict because Mr. Roberts was on the case that you would not have scheduled that case for one you scheduled it for. It would have been reassigned to another judge, right? I, 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 I imagine it would have. Um, it was a date they gave me. I didn't give it to them. So, but to answer your question, your bias says uh, I, I recuse myself. It would, it would have still been put on that date, but we, the process and the paperwork would have had to follow. Right. Wouldn't it have been assigned to a different judge and it would have gone on that judge's docket? Or it would have stayed in this court and I just got up and left and that judge would have come in and take it over, not necessarily that. Right. that. So another judge would have heard that case. But that could affect, yeah. that could affect their decision on when they wanted to go to trial and and then what, and they're planning on whether it be discovery or what else. I mean, if you had disclosed, it, it had the potential to affect their decisions on how to proceed in the case. I guess that's what they could have been thinking, but it wasn't discussed with me. I just did what they asked me to do, which is they walked up, can you put it on whatever day they asked for, and I did it. I mean, I. But, but I'm just, I'm just I mean, saying. I guess, I, I guess it could affect something that they're doing in their minds, but I wasn't privy to it to be able to tell you one way or the other. Uh, on reflection, do you believe that you had a duty to disclose at that time? On reflection, after this, uh, yeah, I would say, uh, by the way, Mr. Ro even though I knew full well they knew, Mr. Robinson represents my son. Okay. Um, the video we watched last night, I just want to confirm that you did uh, ask these questions. Did you, at some point during the interview of your son, ask the investigators or the officers that your son not be arrested? Did you ask right. them? Right. Okay. And did you ask them to release your son? To me, yes. Okay. And do you remember making remarks suggesting that they had a weak case? I may have, because... Okay. And you'd agree that you told your son on more than one occasion to at least temporarily to stop talking? I was shushing him to let the man talk and stop arguing with him. I don't think I was telling him not to talk. Okay. And let me ask you this. From the time you got to the jail to the time you left, do you have a, can you give us an idea of how many hours it was? Maybe three hours. Okay. At any time during the three hours, did the thought cross your mind that you shouldn't be there acting as your son's attorney? 
I wasn't thinking. That's all I can tell you. Uh, my question is, did I, you? It didn't. I did wasn't thinking. ever cross your mind? You said it, no? That was not a, that was not a thought. I, my robe and my motherhood were in two different places. Okay. And my last subject, if you could go to uh, the JQC exhibit uh, 28 and 29. Yes, sir. Okay, on 28, it um, says attached motion should be set as an emergency hearing. And then underneath that, there's circuit judge. And is that your signature? Yes, sir. And on exhibit 29, it says attached motion should be set as non-emergency hearing. There's a check mark. And I believe those are your initials. Yes, sir. Did, or the, did you place those initials there? No, I asked Mrs. Weir to have this file so that it would show up in the computer. Okay. All right, thank you. I have no further questions. Judge Ruth? <clears throat> yeah, I have two quick questions. One, one is a, uh, I need some clarification. When you said you, you, your desire was to have your son released, that could be t t interpreted one, uh, way or the other, which means two ways. Number one, were you suggesting that he should not be booked and released, or are you suggesting that he should be RRR to you after he's booked? Which one were you, what was your objective? My objective was that he was going to the Leon County Jail, and I didn't want him to go to the Leon County Jail I kind of got some comfort when the officer looked back at me and told him, or told him, we're trying to figure out a place to put you because I didn't want him out there because he would, could have been a target for my, my people I've been dealing with all week. So it's more about, I, I don't want him to go to the jail. The next day, uh, if I recall correctly, the sheriff called me and told me, I got your son in protective custody, he'll be okay. So it's, it had more to do with, I don't want him to go out to that jail. So you're concerned about general population? At the way they were doing it, I'm not sure if they had set up a protective custody situation, because most situations where I know of like this, they take you to Wakala or Jefferson or Gatson or Liberty. They don't take a, a law enforcement officer to a jail that they have jurisdiction over. They don't take a, a child of a judge, which is at weird, to a local jail. They take them to out county jails, and I didn't want them to book him into the Leon County Jail without somebody knowing or protecting him, uh, giving him, putting him in protective custody. Okay, so my next question, we know about this arrest and the DUI. Other than those two episodes, had he been arrested before those two episodes? No, sir. Okay, okay. That's, that was it. Okay, Mr. Okay. Tyree. Thank you, Judge. Um, I have a whole page of questions. Fortunately, some of them have already been asked and answered. Uh, sorry? They use the mic. I'm trying. I was saying I, uh, several of my questions have been asked and answered. Uh, I have a few remaining. Yes, sir. Uh, can you tell me just what your immediate and personal reaction was when you learned that your JA was present at your son's first appearance? Okay, being present there didn't give me the consternation. When I learned that she was sitting at council table, I was like, really? Why are you at council? What is the purpose of you being at council table? So I was pretty shocked. Uh, earlier, there was some discussion about preferential treatment. My question is, if my son had been in a similar situation, would your neighbor, the sheriff, have called Major Lee on my behalf? Yes, the situation, yes. Okay, 
because Major, they were trying to set me up with that program and Major Lee was the person and Jonathan and Grant had completely gotten out of the equation. I didn't know to call Major Lee. I didn't know what to do. Excuse, I, excuse me. The question is, did you get preferential treatment, treatment because you're a judge versus the treatment that I would have gotten as an ordinary citizen by having the sheriff call Major Lee? No, sir. Okay. Uh, my last question, uh, and Judge, you'll tell me if this is not appropriate. Uh, given your documented conduct, uh, what besides expressing your regrets, which you've done, would you consider to be the proper outcome of this hearing? What do I think the prop in light of what I've done? I'm going to read it to you again. Given your documented conduct, what besides expressing your regrets, which you have done, would you consider to be the proper outcome of this hearing? From your standpoint? From your standpoint. What should I do going for, for, forward? This panel has to make a decision of some sort at some point in time. I'm going to do this. I'll let our counsel make that argument for her. Thank you. Um, I, d I did have one follow-up to, to Mr. Tyree. So, you, you said they were surprised by the, um, you, when you learned that your J sat at counsel's table. And would that have been shortly after the August 5th hearing? Yeah, it was at the, uh, he gave up me the lecture or um, um, counseled us on or around August 12th when I got back. Okay, and you, and you mentioned earlier that you, subsequently talked to your JA and counseled her and told her to stay away from the case that, that God would take care of it, or words to that effect. How soon after August 12th was that? I mean, that day, going okay. back in that very tight arena, it's like we don't need to do anything. It's going to be fine. All right. The episode with Miss Rosa occurred, I believe, is August 20th or so. Mm -hmm. So that would have been after your conversation with your JA where you told her to stay away from the case. Did you, did you believe that that was consistent with your instruction or, or contrary to your instruction? I mean, I didn't think it was contrary. I mean, Mrs. Rosa was in the office coming and going all the time and Mrs. Ware took her where she could have been anyway. Um, in the elevators, Rosa had her own badge. Um, <coughs> one thing that Mrs. Ware did do when she was down there, the girl, to answer your question, the girl, the other girl, had filed an injunction against Rosa. Erroneously, the clerk sent that up to a second circuit judge. And the only reason I thought that she was going down there was to make sure that, a set, that Rose's didn't go to a Second Circuit judge, which at that time would have been me anyway, but go to Judge Fina, the Third Circuit. Well, so did you know your J.A. was accompanying Miss Rosa at that time? She went downstairs to show her where to file it. Yeah, but did you, were you aware of that at the time? Not really, no, I wasn't. I mean, I was in my chambers when they left. Well, did you know what they were talking about? I think Rosa asked her, will you show me where to file it? Okay. All right, thank you. Chair, I have two additional questions, if that's okay. Um, in, in my notes from your earlier testimony, um, I, I made a notation that you weren't sure when you found out when Judy Ware attended the first appearance, but that you knew she was going to attend the second appearance mm -hmm. and that she took leave. Right. So I took that as an implication that you were aware ahead of time that she was going to, that you were aware ahead of time that she was going to attend the second appearance. I, the second detention here, yes, but I had no idea she would be at that council table. Okay. And then, um, do you recollect when you called uh, Mr. Roberts to represent your son after he was arrested? 
it, it had to be the early morning hours after, after I, it could have been that night when I went home, it could have been in the morning, but it was within 24 hours of being down at the police department. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, I have one or two. All right, go ahead. Um, judge, at the time of the interrogation, do you believe it was, as a sitting judge, appropriate for you to ask the investigating officers to not arrest your son? No. At that point, no. But my purpose was uh, to have him taken somewhere else and not put in that jail. Do you think it was appropriate as a sitting judge to ask an investigating officer not to arrest your son? No, as a sitting judge, no. But as I said, I wouldn't function in this as a sitting judge. Okay. And what, same question about asking the uh, investigating officer to release your son while you're a sitting judge? Same question. No, as a sitting judge, no, but I wasn't. Okay. I known a sitting judge I thought pattern it that evening. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. That's all, right. all I had, Mr. Chief. Any other questions from the panel? Okay, any follow up, Mr. Randolph? Oh, yeah. All right, Mr. Williams, no follow up? Yes, sir. Oh. Uh, <laughs> and I think there is one follow up If there is one question. Counselor. I'm sorry. Ms. Uh, Ms. Hall, I think early on I asked you a question uh, regarding a search warrant or a search of your computer system uh, by, and it was, I was corrected, uh, not by JQC, but by uh, Judge Schuster. Mm -hmm. Was that search limited to one day, the day involving the, uh, not, the uh, not any other time other than the day uh, of which there became an issue about the, uh, your son coming up, getting uh, uh, the card of Ms. Ware and going down in, in her badge and using it to go downstairs? Is that when it was limited to? Yes, I guess. Let me tell you, I didn't even know they searched my computer until you showed the document to me, which had come from Mr. Slayton. So I was in shock to find they had done it. So I, I, I assume that was just that day. All right. All right. Thank you. Can okay. I have a follow up real quick? That's not your personal computer. That belongs to the state of Florida or the court system, right? <laughs> Okay, I just want to clarify, they weren't on your personal computer, but it was not. No, no, but it, it was a state computer. Okay, thank you. I thank you, Judge. You may oh. step down. We just ask for scheduling purposes. Uh, who will the next witness be? <coughs> no, actually, I guess the, your case. It's still the JQC's case, uh, but at this juncture, the JQC will rest so that Mr. Randolph can present his witnesses. Okay, thank you. Yes, Your Honor, we have a couple of witnesses, depending on this court, they're very short, I think, Major Lee is here from the Leon County Sheriff's Department. All right. Um, We'd like to call him, but I think he will be a very short witness. Mr. Williams, think it'll be short as well? Yes, yes. All right, we'll go ahead and take Major Lee, and then we'll break for lunch. All right.
and while he's waiting, uh, Mr. Chair, there's one other witness out there as well who I think will be very short too. Kirk, this is from the clerk's office. Mr. Kent is out there as well. So I don't okay. think that that's the only. Are you going to have any witnesses after uh, Major Lee and, and Mr. Kelly? Uh, we have uh, a couple of character witnesses who have uh, our old standby, and okay. they will be available right after lunch, whenever you want. Okay, and that's. And Gary Ross, Attorney Gary Ross, is also. After lunch. Okay. And we'll see how quick uh, Major Lee goes, and then maybe we'll take the Mr. Kelly as well. All right, sir, if you'd raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm, tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? All right, please be seated. Good afternoon, Major Lee. Afternoon. All right. Uh, would you uh, give us your official title and uh, where you work, please? Uh, title is the Chief of Administration at the Leon County Sheriff's Office. Are you also known as Major Lee? I recently was promoted about a year ago, and I was a major before that. During um, August 2019, did you have a video visitation program in place? Yes, sir. Would you explain that, please? It was a video visitation program that we had contracted with GTL, for the detention center, and in place, it was new. Uh, several problems with it. We have since went to another provider because we had so many problems with it. But it was to allow the inmates to have visitation with their families from home in remote areas. Are recordings made of the uh, video visitation at the facility? Yes, sir. Are they monitored? They are monitored occasionally to check for violations of policies, but they're not fully monitored. In August 2019, you were aware, were you not, that Judge Hobbs' son was at the detention facility? Yes, sir. Did Judge Hobbs have contact with you regarding the video visitation program? Yes, sir. Did you also have conversations with Grant Sladen regarding the video visitation program? Yes, sir. And also the use of the program by Judge Hobbs? Yes, sir. Did Judge Hobbs also mention to you about coming to the detention facility in person? Yes, sir. Did you have a recommendation to her regarding that? I recommended that she not uh, in fear would put her son's uh, safety in jeopardy. Was a video visitation program offered to Judge Hobbs for her use with visiting with her son. Yes, sir. And this is a program that's offered to the general public who would have family members at the detention facility. Yes, sir. Did you consider that to be preferential treatment for Judge Hobbs? No. 
were you aware that uh, Judge Hobbs had a problem with that, with using that particular program? Yes, sir. Uh, if you would look in that white book, you have, that's the black book, the one, oh, the other one is the white book. And look at tab two. Okay. Do you recall receiving that email from Grant Sladen? Vaguely, yes, sir. So again, you and Grant Sladen communicated about Judge Hobbs having visitation with her son in particular regarding the video visitation. Yes, sir. Did Judge Hobbs ever request from you any favoritism or preferential treatment in visiting with her son? No, sir. Did Judge Hobbs ever request you to arrange or provide her with unmonitored or unrecorded telephonic and or video contact with her son while he was at the jail? No, sir. I have no further questions. Okay, any cross-examination? Very briefly. Good morning. morning. <clears throat> Can you tell us who contacted you first about arranging visitation for Judge Hobbs? Was it Mr. Sladen or Judge Hobbs? Pretty sure it was uh, Mr. Sladen. Okay, and you provided him with a, a, a video option that could work for Judge Hobbs, is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Is that the same video system or a different video system than she wound up using? Uh, I'm not certain if, if she ever used it. I don't, I'm not sure if she ever was able to use it. So. Okay. So um, when Judge Hobbs contacted you later on, you provided her with a new video link system to use? Is that? Yes, sir. Okay. So what, when Judge Hobbs contacted you, what options did you provide her? When she contacted me, I connected her with a lieutenant uh, that was more familiar with the program to try to help her uh, log on to the system. If I remember right, she was having problems logging on to the system. You have to create an account before you can use the system, and she was having problems with that. Okay. <clears throat> so it's, just so I'm clear, there's only one video visitation system used at the jail? Correct. For visitation, that's correct. Is there any other type of video system? The courts use another one that's solely... For, are used by the public defender's office for their attorney-client conferences. Uh, yes, and uh, I believe they're doing first appearance on it now. Yes, sir. Okay. Let's talk about that. So the <clears throat> telephone and video calls from members of the public to detainees at the jail, uh, I think you said, are recorded and sometimes monitored. Is that accurate? Uh, the public does not call the inmates at the facility. They have to call the public. Okay. And yes, they are um, <clears throat> recorded. Okay. Um, I assume that attorney-client communications would not be recorded. No, sir. Okay. Are there any other types of communications from detainees with members of the public that are not recorded? Uh, regular visitation is not recorded. Okay. In other words, in-person visitation. Okay. And tell me about, uh, Judge Hobbs testified that uh, Sheriff McNeil said he would call you regarding this. Um, tell us about Sheriff McNeil contacting you. In all honesty, I do not remember Sheriff McNeil calling me. Okay. All right. I don't have any other questions. Any redirect? No redirect. All right. Any questions from the panel? Uh, just a few. 
Well, let me make sure I have your rank correct. Is it major today? Is that? No, sir, it's chief. Okay, chief. Yes, sir. Um, you testified that Judge Hobbs never asked for special or preferential treatment, correct? That is correct. Okay. Did anybody on her behalf, either Mr. Sladen or the chief judge, ever contact you requesting special or preferential treatment on behalf of Mrs. Hobbs? No, sir. Okay. Thank you. That's all I have, Mr. Chair. Any other questions for the panel? No. All right. Thank you very much, sir. You're free to go. Thank you. And we'll go ahead then and do Mr. Kelly since we still have a few minutes. Mr. Chair, I, I can bring one more in, which right. is also right. short. Do I, is Mr. Kelly, okay. is, is that the right name? Ken of Kent. Ken Kent. Ken Kent. Ken Kent. Okay, sorry about Ken that. Ken Kent. Ken. Okay. I said Kelly before. Got the first name. Got the first two letters. All right, sir, if you'd raise your right hand, do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. All right, please be seated. Good afternoon, Mr. Kent. Good afternoon. Um, if you will state your name and where you are employed and your position. My name is Kenneth Kent. I'm employed with the Leon Clerk of the Circuit Court and Controller. I'm the yeah, Civil Court. Please Courts. move the mic. Get close. Yes. You want me to repeat all that? Yes. Okay. You, you can pull it to you. Okay. My name is Kenneth Kent. I'm employed by the Leon County Clerk of the Circuit Court and Controller. And I'm the Civil Courts Director. And how long have you been in that position approximately? About three and a half years. Let me call your attention to um, August 19, 2019. Uh, did you have an occasion to meet with Judge Hobbs, J.A. Judy Ware? Yes. And what, what were you meeting with her about? Dean Bauman, who is our Chief Information Officer, and I went up to speak to Ms. Ware in regards to training on the case management systems in the office so that they would be paperless. And when you speak of becoming paperless, what, what do you mean by that? Principally, the ability for us to send up pleadings electronically and receive those pleadings back electronically. Now, let me take you to you, uh, August 20th, the following day. There come an occasion where you had to go up to Judge Hobbs' office. Yes. And what was your purpose in doing that? My purpose was to take pleadings up to the court and then any 
order signed by the court to return those back to our civil courts department intake. Um, at the end of the day, we have a responsibility along with the court and the sheriff's office to process any domestic violence injunctions for protection pleadings. Uh, we send those up to the court. The court will make a decision. Uh, they will send those documents down to us. And then if there are to be, there's documents to be served on the respondents, those will be provided to the sheriff's office so that they can be served that day. And we had an electron. We have an electronic process in place. It was my understanding that the court had not yet had a chance to uh, learn how to use those. So it's critical that uh, those documents be brought up to the court for their review, and critical to bring any signed orders back down so that uh, they can be handled. And if they were so directed by the court, to be served on respondents. Um, on that particular day, did you do you recall having a discussion with uh, Grant Sladen regarding um, why you were going in and out of Judge Hobbs' office? I, I do not remember that. Do you recall having a conversation with Grant Sladen regarding Judge Hobbs' son having card access to one of the restricted elevators. I do, I do not remember the date, but I do recall that he did contact me and ask me about that. And did you, strike that, were you reluctant to talk to Mr. Sladen about that? The information was provided to me by an employee uh, in the office who had, who had been in the elevator. Uh, for me to speak to it was secondhand. While I did report it upon hearing about it to my supervisor, the deputy clerk, I'm always reluctant to, to repeat something that I'm not familiar with myself. And did you re express your reluctancy to Mrs. Slayton? I believe I did, at least that's what I understood he said yesterday. Sir, let me um, have you in the black binder. If you would look at tab 19, please. That's the JQC exhibit 19. And that first page, if you will go down that chart to 4.06 p.m. where you would see your name as entering Judge Hobbs' chambers. Yes. And there are several other entries with you going in and out. So is that the same day that we were Speaking of earlier, that you were going in and out of Judge Hobbs' office. My memory is that there was several times that week I went in and out of Judge Hobbs' office, particularly at that time period, about the end of the day. Our goal is to try and have everything wrapped up by 4.30 if possible, or as soon as, as possible after 4.30. So that would be consistent with that. Was, uh, to your recollection, was Judge Hobbs the duty judge at that for that week? I believe so. She was the judge that we were bringing up injunction pleadings to. I have no further questions. No questions. Okay. Are there any questions from the panel? I have just one or one or two. If Judge Hobbs sends you your office, the clerk's office, uh, directive that if any new cases come in where Mr. Gary Roberts is uh, counsel, I have a conflict, I recuse myself, please send it somewhere else. Will y'all abide by that? I, I don't ever recall receiving a, an order like that. We, 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 I don't ever remember seeing an order directing us regarding counsel. We've had orders from the court 
directing us not to accept pleadings from certain uh, parties, such as parties determined subsequently to be vexatious litigants, but I don't recall ever getting an order okay. like that before. Do you have any process that, for automatic recusals of certain people with judges? I believe that I would go to my uh, boss and to our in-house counsel to discuss that. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. I don't have any further questions. Uh, one question, Chair. Do you recollect at all on the day of August 20th having any discussions about an injunction involving um, Ms. Christine Rosa at all with Ms. Ware or Judge Hobbs? I do not recall having a discussion w with them about any particular uh, party before the court. Okay, thank you. No questions. Thank you, sir. All right. We'll go ahead and uh, be in I apologize. follow up on uh, um, Mr. White's question about a standing order. Microphone. Hmm? Microphone. 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 We have Okay. In, in Duval, we don't have a standing <laughs> recusal policy, but the chief judge periodically would in, in a, a, a administrative order towards a party that is abusing the system. Mm -hmm. So is that what you're talking about? Well, I'll give you a recent example. We have an individual who has filed over a dozen cases in circuit civil right. and has, I think, the court has ruled against her on five of those. We received an order recently in which the, the judge, not the chief judge, but the judge in that case, uh, determined the party be a vexatious litigant and directed the clerk to accept no further pleadings from that party. Also went and looked up the statute on that and saw that the clerk has a duty to uh, report to the Supreme Court clerk that individual's name and address and that my understanding is that they're then put on a statewide vexatious litigant list. We will get certain special things from the court in an order from time to time. For example, I got one uh, today saying the clerk shall advertise something in a, in a civil action case. I don't recall getting orders from administrative orders from the chief judge directing the clerk to exclude or treat parties differently. That's, those tend to be more with my experience in the time I've been there, those have been directed by the, the judge in the case specifically. Thank you. Mr. Tyler, any questions? Are there any follow-up? No questions. One follow-up. Mr. Kent, thank you for coming today. Um, let's separate the idea of a standing recusal order, which I think you said is not something that's used around here and let's take the more common example of a order of recusal in a case where a judge says I'm entering an order of recusal that happens here in the Second Circuit entering an order of recusal you mean for the judge themselves yes I would assume it does I'm, I haven't personally witnessed one of those but okay. I assume that does all right and and on behalf of the clerk's office if a judge entered a lawful order recusing themselves would the clerk's office obey that order yes Be thank you oh. huh? Did, sorry please finish we uh, have a system that assigns <coughs> cases to judges so anytime there's a change in the uh, assignment that is something that we have to we have to have programming changes into our case system to account for that okay thank you sir if, it, if, it, if there is an order of recusal entered will the case be reassigned to a different division it would be reassigned to a different judge right, the I'm judges are assigned to a different division right I'm sorry the judges are assigned to a particular division right Yes, they are. I don't know if you, do you number them or letters or how, how does that work? The court gives us administrative orders where the divisions are by letter, as my memory. Okay. And there's judges within those divisions. Each judge gets a certain percentage of cases. All right, so if the judge in Division C 
uh, enter an order of recusal, would the case then be assigned to a different division? I'm not certain because we have counters in place embedded in our case management software depending on if it was recusal for one case or recusal for all cases within that division. If that judge was moved out of that division, then we, we would, our IT department would then have Let's to... Let's assume the judge is not moved out of division, it's one case. Then it would go to the next judge on that counter. Which would be a different division? Oh, I don't believe so. It would be within the same division. Well, all right, maybe I'm using... The, I'm not talking about family division versus criminal division. I'm talking about division A versus division B versus division well, C. We, my understanding is we, we have more than, usually more than one judge in a division unless it's something like probate and juvenile where there's right, actually right, just one judge assigned. Say you have three judges in, in, that handle felonies. Okay. If a judge, in one of those judges entered an order of recusal would the case then be assigned to one of the other two felony judges? First, my apologies, I don't work in felony, but if it works the way civil does, then the short answer is yes. Okay, all right, thank you. We'll go ahead and... Yes? All right, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Kent, the reassignment of the case to another judge, is that done by the chief judge or your office? Chief judge. I, I would have to look at what the instructions were. Okay. I mean, if it simply said this judge is not, no longer handling this, um, I don't know. I mean, I, I would assume if it's a case already in operation, I would hope that the order would just give us that instruction. All right, no question. All right, we'll be in recess till 130.
If the police court, we have our next witness who is present. It's Attorney Gary Roberts. I might okay. just step outside and make sure, sure he's here. Thank you. Yeah, you get it. How is your husband going in physically? His office or they have it up? Um. And tell them Mike's still on. Hmm? Tell them Mike is still on. Yeah, they're just talking. All right, sir, if you'd raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. All right, please be seated. Good evening, Mr. Roberts. Good afternoon, Ms. Randolph. Would you state your complete name and address for the record, please? Yes, Gary Anthony Roberts, 130 Salem Court, Tallahassee, Florida, 32301. And what is your present occupation, uh, Mr. Roberts? Attorney at law. Right. Gary Roberts and Associates. Uh, how long um, have you been practicing, Mr. Uh, 25 years. All right. And would you tell the court uh, uh, and the members of the panel uh, about your background, your educational background? Um, Florida State Law School, graduated in 19, it's, it's moving so fast, 1995. <laughs> state attorney, prosecutor. Um, after that, um, worked in private practice, then started my own business, and I've been in business for about 23 years um, by, by myself or with associates. And I'm also a city attorney for a local municipality as well. All right. Now, as far as the uh, background on the criminal area, oh. I think you mentioned that- oh, I'm sorry, I practice uh, criminal law. Um, I do a lot of federal, um, state and uh, and I've been doing criminal defense work all, that entire time, so I'm very familiar with the criminal defense process. All right. And most um, uh, most of that practice has been in this area of the state. Yes. Right. Now <clears throat> you mentioned also uh, that you had been a former prosecutor. Is, yes. Was that here in Leon County? Yes, it was in Leon County. All right. And. Would you give us the benefit of the types of cases that you were handling as a prosecutor as well as defense lawyer? Um, some misdemeanors, felonies, juvenile, things of that nature. All right. And you stayed in that office for how many uh, years? Just about, about a year. But I, was, I did an internship, things of that nature, with, with Ms. Meggs. Um, you said, oh, Mr. Willie Mr. Meggs? Meggs, yes, the yeah, when prior, was former um, state attorney. All right. Now, if you would, uh, Mr. Roberts, let's turn to the early, to, I won't say the early, late July the 29th, early morning hours of July the 30th, 2019. Did you have any occasion to come in contact with anyone uh, with uh, a, 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 a person by the name of Jason Haynes? Uh, Justin Haynes? Yes, Justin Haynes. Right? Yes, I was contacted by his mother. When were you contacted by his mother? Um, it, I, I would practice keeping my phone off because if you get calls all hours of the night, so I tend to keep my phone off. So it had to, and I normally wake up around 7 ish, so it should be around that time, anywhere between 6 30 and 8 30 in the morning, something of that nature. 
And was that uh, in the morning hours of, that would have been, I think, July the 30th, 2019? Yes, that was in the morning hours, yes. And she, she, was, she was in a crisis state, I remember that. All right. Well, let's go backward for a moment before we go through that day. Had you, you were told by the mother uh, what, uh, 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 who she wished you to, uh, to talk to, to, to perhaps represent? Yes, and but prior to that, I represented Justin on a misdemeanor DUI. So, I, so I'm familiar with Justin, because um, I had him on a misdemeanor DUI um, case, a 2018 traffic case. All right. And, <clears throat> and that's the only case that you had had with, with uh, Mr. Haynes prior to that time? Yes. Now, had that case, the one in 2018, was it complete by July the 30th, 2019? It was complete to the extent that we had uh, a deal in place with the prosecutor. The prosecutor in the case was a senior type prosecutor, Mr. Bevel, and we had a deal in place uh, where we were going to plead Justin out. However, we didn't enter the plea, but we had a deal in place. That's it. Well, let's go back then to the morning, early morning hours of July the 30th, 2019. Is that, was the call from his mother, uh, Judge, uh, the judge, Judge Hobbs in this case, was that the first time you heard about the case? Yes. What action, if any, did you take as far as uh, making contact with Mr. Haynes after receiving that information from his mother? He was, he was, in, he was incarcerated from what I, what I understood, he was incarcerated. And uh, so at some point, I don't know if I, I believe I went to see him at the jail, something like that, or um, and just in basic interview trying to figure out what's going on. Um, and then we had a set up to have a detention here or a, a motion here to get him released on bond. All right. Now, where was the hearing set up, uh, the first appearance and the detention here, hearing? Where, where were they held? Uh, not, I think, <clears throat> excuse me, it's at the jail. I believe the first one was at the jail. And the jail is an informal setting when you um, have first appearance at the jail. Uh, sometimes judges don't even come with robes and sometimes the people there, prosecutors, the attorneys there, dress very casual. And it's because of the informal nature of this jail setting. Now, did you meet any member of the family there uh, on it, at the first appearances? Yes, Justin's grandfather was there, and Judy Ware was there, and obviously I was there. But one of the things that happened is uh, her, her dad, you know, just being polite, he, just, he doesn't hear well, so it's difficult to communicate with him. All right. Now, was her father sitting at the council table first with you? Yes, what I wanted to do was let the judge know that if Justin is released or granted a bond, where he would stay because he's also a caretaker for his, his grandfather would do things for him. But, uh, but, but we have the prosecutor there, we have, I'm there, and I can't communicate clearly with Mr. Hobbs, that's the grandfather, so I asked Ms. Ms. Ware to come up with me to sit between me and Mr. Hobbs so she could communicate with him for me and let him know where we are in the proceedings and things of that nature. So I asked Ms. Ware to come up to council table. All right, and did she, uh and she obliged. She obliged your yeah. request. Yeah. Now, tell us what happened at that uh, hearing. We just, we just had the hearing, um, and evidence was put on um, by the state where they wanted to keep him in custody, and, and we argued uh, that he should not be held in custody. Right. Was he held in custody at that time? I believe he was held in custody, and we had to have a second hearing, because I think there was a motion filed to um, for violation of pretrial release conditions because he was on a misdemeanor bond at the time. So we had a, a second hearing after that. Right. <clears throat> Are you still representing uh, Mr. Haynes for this offense? Yes, I so, am. Yes, I am. And what was he charged with at that time? When he was initially brought into the, the, the criminal justice system, he was charged with aggravated battery. Um, you know, uh, then, after he was, um, maybe a couple of months later, the prosecutor upped the charge or amended the charge to attempted murder. 
and, um, and uh, shooting into an occupied structure and, and because there's a dog involved that was actually shot, they charged him also with shooting the animal. Now, I know that you've been working on, are you the sole attorney on that case or is there someone? I else? have other attorneys, but I've been doing all the heavy lifting. I've been, I've been taking a lot of depositions. Um, we have experts, we have, it's been a lot of work. All right. Now, <clears throat> by the way, when you were there, the, was there a Leon County Jail uh, present at the jail or was there a, a, a judge from another location? No, the, the, the case, because it, it needed special handling, so it went to a special prosecutor and it went over to the Live Oak Division. I, I don't know if that's the third circuit. I think it's the third circuit. And they have a special prosecutor there that was handling the case, and, and it's Judge Fino, um, who was a judge assigned to it, and a prosecutor out of this, the, this, that circuit in Live Oak, Florida. Now, whenever there is a son or daughter or someone who uh, works within the court system, do they make s special provisions as far as any kind of security at the jail uh, uh, to make sure that they're okay well, during the case? My understanding is that they should put them in some type of protective custody and their image online is, is blocked so you don't have access to it for confidentiality reasons. All right. Now, <clears throat> the second time that you were there, well, first of all, did you have any other contact with anyone else uh, as relates to the system before that second hearing? I think, I think it was August the 5th on around. Yeah, we had, it, it, uh, just, just back and forth, I probably had some emails back with the prosecutor and things of that nature. And I think I may have talked to Magna, who was the officer in the case, because there are some issues as to credibility of the victim. Um, there's an issue of whether the the dog in question that bit Mr. Haynes had previously attacked uh, uh, a boyfriend of the alleged victim, and I had evidence of that, so I shared that with um, the prosecutor as well. So, of course, I don't want to get into the Thank case, you. but uh, that is a matter that's been brought to the attention. Yes. This, this is not the first time. No, no, it wasn't the first time. <laughs> now, In regard to uh, what happened uh, next, were there months then that passed before you actually came in contact or uh, in front of Judge uh, Hobbs here? Yes. Um, going into, uh, I think it was Mayish, um, just for, by way of background, there's a, two cases I had, the um, Daisha Ponder and the Madison. Bailey Felton case. Um, one was to be set for trial at a case management conference, and one was a deferred prosecution agreement. Just to, for clarification purposes, those cases were not in front of Judge Hobbs. They were set in front of Judge Dempsey. Judge Hobbs happened to inherit Judge Dempsey's docket. But also companion to Taisha Ponder's case, there was another case of, of Kiana Morris, who was a co-defendant, but was charged in a separate court and I filed a standing ground motion in that case that was subsequently dismissed by the state and I wanted similar treatment to Ms. Ponder in a felony case so me and a felony prosecutor's going back and forth with that. Well, let's back up for a moment. That first case that you said that, that you appeared in, uh, in, uh, in front of Judge Hobbs, were you aware that she was going to be there that day? Oh, was the, 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 I mean, the, 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 there's information that, you know, obviously that there's a new judge, things of that nature um, coming in. Uh, we did hear that, that, that she was going to come in. Um, we did hear that. All right. Tell us what happens when you, when you came in to court, from your recollection, in front of Judge Hall the first time around. Uh, when, in the Ponder case, just came in as just an issue of passing a case, because one of the things you got to, it's, it's a case management conference. So me and the prosecutor has been going back and forth with this case for a while. So we just wanted to put the case on a trial docket. It was not a, any other issue other than that. We wanted to place the case on a trial docket because at some point I wanted to file my standing ground motion to be heard at some subsequent point in the future. All right. So <clears throat> you appeared there. 
Now, were there a number of other lawyers there on oh, cases? It's, it's, you got jail defendants, you got um, private counsel, you got a public defender, the courtroom was packed, you got people everywhere. There's multiple dockets being happen, um, going on at the same time. There's like a nine o'clock, uh, 8.30 docket, nine o'clock docket, 10 o'clock docket, things of that nature. So the judge is, has a bunch of paperwork in front of her trying to figure out what's going on, who's what. So it's, it's a lot. It's, it's like a, I'm not going to call it a circus, but a lot's happening. Now, is, uh, do are, are private lawyers called first? <laughs> Traditionally, yes. <clears throat> now, once you went in front of her on that occasion, uh, was that a joint motion between you and the state? For, to, to move it for the next 30 days? Yeah, it was, it was agreement because you, you normally what happens is that you go over to the prosecutor and you say, hey, we got this case up on the docket. What do you want to do? And we discuss what you want to set it in August, you want to set it in September, November. And we talk about it, then we'll go and announce it to the court what the prosecutor and the defense wants to do. Is this a process when you say you just announce it to the judge? You, you go up in front of it, just like I'm standing here now, and, and you, you <coughs> make a presentation. Uh, quickly and and tell her both prosecutor and defense you, you go up and you say get her out some baptized ponder the state's here we want to move the, set the case for trial in september and the clerk announces the dates and that's what happens right. and i'm in 25 i've never had a judge say i'm not gonna give you that date. so and both, and that's not done just because of perfunctory matter yes for case management exactly now, was there anything else about that case other than the fact that you found out that uh, Judge, uh, uh, you had a new judge on that case? Was that happened? Nothing eventful. It's um, just, it's a, it's a straight case where I'm going to file a standing ground motion. Um, and eventually, um, you want to put the burden on the state to bring witnesses, because based on the first case, I knew that the state was having a tremendous problem bringing witnesses, and they already wrote in a written all process that the victims in the case were actually the aggressors and the persons who, who started the violence and my clients defended themselves properly. Now, once you left there that day at the case management, did this case ever come in front of Judge Hobbs again? No. no never what called what happened to the case? Um, the case was eventually heard in front of Judge Marsh. Um, we had a date uh, in August. Um, the witnesses, like the state believed, didn't show, and the case was continued to believe to September 9th or 10th, and then um, we had a hearing. Uh, the witnesses were called. Uh, one was via video feed, and after the case was, uh, the prosecutor put on the case, Judge March said, don't even put on the case. I'm granting your motion, and the case was dismissed. All right, and that was the end of that case? That was the end of that case. Let's talk about the second case. Well, did, did you have a second case that came in front of uh, Judge Hobbs as well? Yes, that, was a, that case involved uh, a deferred prosecution agreement with my client. Um, and what was interesting and memorable about it was she was an FSU student who had a very bright future. And I wanted to have her case enter the deferred so we could get a record seal so she could pursue the dreams that she had. And one of the things I remember about the case was I had to literally go to one of the prosecutors and she said, you need to come and sell me on this particular person. So we had to write stuff up. So we went um, and I gave her my best pitch of why this person deserves a DPA. She said, I'll do it. We went to, so the next time we're in court, it's just a matter of signing the DPA between the lawyer for the defense, the prosecution, and, it's entered in, and my client, and it's entered into the records for the clerk. It's a non-judicial handling. So all the judge does, uh, for example, is set it for a date, but that date is just for the purposes of making sure that the paperwork is entered. She doesn't see the document, doesn't touch the document. The document is not even sent to the judge again? No, we, we send it and then it's, it's done and my client does what she's supposed to do and the case ends. And then I get a record seal. All right. And that is what happened in this case? Yes. All right. And those were the two cases that uh, uh, went in front of Judge Hobbs at that time? Yes. Did Judge Hobbs and any, anybody, and uh, well, let me strike that. Did the prosecution know that you had had any previous dealings or, work, or worked in any way with uh, the 
uh, her son. Well, let's just back up. Yeah, it's Justin Haynes worked in the clerk's office and worked in the courthouse. So when I would go on other cases, he's sitting there with in the clerk in front of other judges with other prosecutors. Um, the prosecutor that was handling his case worked in front of Judge Hobbs. We talk, he knew the Judge Hobbs case, our Judge Hobbs son, and we went and, and we looked at the case and we talked to make sure that whatever disposition he's making is not a disposition in regard to anyone but the facts of this particular case and we thought a reckless driving was appropriate. I wanted something more, but a reckless driving was appropriate now it was agreeable. So it was common knowledge that Justin Haynes is Judge Hobbs' son. There's no mistake about that. All right, and did anybody ask you ask for a recusal in either one of those cases on your behalf? No, no. And um, also, just to backtrack, there was a motion that I filed, because I did have a chance to read the complaint before I got here, where it says that I specifically sent Judge Hobbs the motion on standing ground. That is absolutely not correct. You don't send a judge a motion, you send a motion to the clerk you put the judge's information on it as identifiers. So in order to um, call the motion up, you would then contact the judge and her JA for the purposes of setting it, but you normally, and then you include everyone, the prosecutors, everyone is on that um, email chain as well. Then a notice of hearing is sent, I'll create that, or the state would create that, then we send it out. That was never done in this and case. And that was done, you would have to, to, to start have the to process. Be, exactly. All right. Exactly. And so Judge Hobbs had no other uh, contact with this case she, before? She would have no, absolutely no idea I filed the motion. Because it's just held in the clerk's office until? Because I filed it with the clerk. No one sends a motion to a judge unless you are trying to call the motion up. We just file with the clerk's office and the clerk's office warehouse it. And uh, that never happened in this case. Never happened. Just one more. Yeah. Sure. I have no further questions. Right. Any cross examination? Very briefly. Good afternoon, Mr. Roberts. Good afternoon. Uh, I will be as brief as I possibly can. Um, the let's assume for a second i know as lawyers we hate to do that let's assume that judge hobbs was not moved out of the criminal division when she was uh -huh. for the purposes of these two questions if judge hobbs had not been moved out of that division she would have continued to preside over the ponder and the felton case she would have if i called the motion up and you're referring to the motion you filed in the Ponder case. Exactly. So she would have been called to decide that motion to dismiss? Not necessarily. Okay. And one of the reasons why I didn't call it up was because I wouldn't want to put her in that position to make a decision. And the DPA that was filed, if the DPA was not successful, that case would have returned to her, to her jurisdiction, correct? I've never had a DPA that was not signed by a client and a prosecutor that everyone agreed on. Never okay. Had that and if the client didn't meet the terms of the DPA? My client begged me to get a DPA. Then. That's not my question. My question is if the client didn't meet the terms of the DPA, that case would have returned to Judge Hobbs's division. Is that correct? Yes, yes. Thank you. I don't have any further questions. All right. Any redirect? No, Your Honor. Uh, questions from the panel, Mr. Tyree, Judge Ruth? You indicated uh, that the prosecutor had some contact with, with the case. Did, are you saying that with the DUI or with the felony? Which prosecutor? Now, you say the prosecutor in her courtroom. I think that's what you yeah, said. That, yes, let me go back. What happened is when Judge Hobbs was in Gadsden County, which is a neighboring county west of Ogallockney, she's over there. The prosecutor that, uh, when she was transferred back to the division in Tallahassee, her same courtroom prosecutor, for whatever reason, don't know, came over also, and he took over the misdemeanor division where Judge Hobbs' son was, because he was not the original prosecutor on the case. So he came in and took over the, the prosecution of Judge Hobbs' son, son's case. So he's aware, that's, that's where I was getting. So on a daily basis, he had more contact with Judge Hobbs than you? Extremely. Okay. 
And now, with, with that case, you said it was cattle called. It came up, the stay in your ground case. Was that assigned to her? It just so happened she happened to be at no, cattle call. I'm sorry, sir. She inherited that case. Okay. It was, it was uh, on when she took over Judge Dempsey's docket. That case just happened to be on Judge Dem on okay. Ms. Okay. Judge okay. Hobbs just walked right into it. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Shafino. No, sir. No, no questions. Ms. McAvoy. Um, just to clarify, so you just mentioned that you believed it would have been. I don't want to put words in your mouth, so I'll, I'll ask you to just clarify it. But basically, improper, you would not have wanted to put her in the position of ruling on a motion in front of her. So, so would you agree that it would be improper for her to be hearing cases that you were on because you were handling her son's DUI? Now, what happened in, in this particular case, and I don't want to comment on improprieties or of that nature, I'll leave that to you guys. But I took the position that I would not call the case up because I would not want to put her in that position to even make the decision. Because I've always taken the position that it probably would have been a recusal because had she known that if I would have called the case up, there's no question in my mind she would recuse herself. No question. Okay, thank you. So I answered that way. No question that she would have. Mr. White. Yeah, briefly. Thank you for being here today, Mr. Roberts. Thank you. Also. So when you mentioned, I'll call it case number one, because I don't call the name, but so you attend a case management conference. You request the judge set it for trial, and it's set in September. Is that right? Yes. Give or take. So when you walk out of that hearing that day, the reality is your case is going to be decided by Judge Hobbs for all intent and purposes at that point in time. No. She, well, she, she set it on her trial docket, okay? And that's where it sits status-wise when you walk out that day. Yes, when I walk out. Your case is set in front of Judge Hobbs. It, yes. Okay. But if I could add for clarification sure. purposes, it's a stand your ground case. So the judge cannot rule on the stand your ground case the way I'm, I'm hearing the implications. The stand your ground case is, is the way it's set up and the case law changed after 2017 and um, codified by rules, the state has the burden. I don't have to put my client on. They have the burden of showing that my client did not, was not justified in use of force. Okay. And I knew that the prosecution would have problems with that based on the companion case that was dismissed by the right. case. That's all. So I just wanted yeah. to put the state. But just where I'm, I'm clear, you're obviously not clairvoyant or you wouldn't be sitting here today. But if you go and try that motion and you lose it, then your case is set for trial in front of Judge Hobbs, right? If, but yes, but I, if I would have called the case up, there would have been a recusal. There's no question on my that. I'm sorry, if you call it up, what would have happened? I said, if I would have called the case up, it would have been a recusal. How would it, who would have recused? Well, would, if she didn't, I would uh, mention it to the state because, uh, for example, um, I've seen it and I've been a part of proceedings where counsel, and I have advised lawyers on this, where if there's any issues with the lawyers and the judges as far as closeness, contact, mm -hmm. you send an email, hey, I did this or I did this or I know this, and let them make a determination. Um, for example, mm -hmm. I had a case where... Well, let me ask you, I want to stick to this case. Sure. Had you and the prosecutor, had you disclosed the possible conflict and did you have discussions before the stand their ground motion was set that if it came to that the judge would recuse herself or y'all would request that I mean did you did no. you have discussions with the state attorney on this no we never had any discussions on that well then how do you know the state attorney you would have had it recused no I'm saying if I would have called the case up I am very comfortable she would judge Hobbs would recuse herself. That's what I'm saying. Not being clairvoyant, but that's what I believe. Okay. All right. Thank you. I don't have any further questions. Thank you so I much for the question, sir. Follow up question. So who who was the judge who ruled on the co defendants stand your ground? It was a misdemeanor judge. I don't have a copy though. It was actually I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It wasn't a judge. 
it was a written down promise by the state attorney's office because so there was no you didn't have to have the hearing we didn't know that exactly we didn't have to, and that was my reasoning because they couldn't prove the first co-defendant so i knew that witness wise and evidence wise if you, you can't prove a you're not going to prove b and that's the reason why the motion was filed to push the uh miss ponder's case to closure yeah as a former prosecutor so i guess you, you said that for trial is just to force the state to go on and make a decision exactly Okay, I see what you're saying. And I thought before they even got to that point, the case was going to be dismissed by the state, by null process, second null process, which didn't happen. Was it ultimately null process? No, we went to a hearing in front of Judge Marsh, and he heard the evidence and dismissed the case. Okay. Right. Mr. Shafino. I'm good. The stand your ground motion, that was filed before this hearing? Where it was continued, or was the motion, the, the, the stand your ground motion? It was, it was filed afterwards, because we because it was still in case management status and was filed afterwards. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Mr. Roberts, so you filed the motion on June 27th, which was after- That sounds correct. This docket sounded. So if the, you said the state had the burden of proof. Yes. So the state, you would expect the state would, would notice, the case, notice that motion for hearing? No, I don't think the state would have. I would be the one trying to notice because they couldn't find witnesses, so they would not call the case. But they would have the, they could notice it for hearing. <laughs> they could, I've never seen it happen, but they could. Well, they, they, need, they would know they would need to take care of the motion before the case went to trial. Yes. All right, so if the state did, just, did notice the case for hearing, would they contact the JA? to set it for hearing? No, normally if they're gonna set it for hearing, they would contact me and ask me what my available dates are with the JA being CC, things of that nature. Right. But, but bottom line is whether it's both you on the phone or one of you, you'd contact the JA and say, uh, we need an hour for hearing or two hours or whatever. Exactly. Okay, so what JA would you have had to contact or would the state have to contact uh, on June 28th, after you filed the motion. Well, it, it was not contemplated to bring well, the case up. I would, if they had to contact a JA. Okay, but my question is, who would they have to, which JA would they contact to set the hearing? They would have to contact Judge Hobbs' JA. Okay, or they could file a motion to recuse, right? Or they could file a motion to recuse, exactly. So they'd have to make that choice. Exactly. Okay, all right, thank you. Any uh, other questions? All right, any follow-up? No, sir. All right, thank you, sir. You're free to go. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, who's the next witness? Yes, Sean. Sorry. It would be Attorney Nancy Daniels. We're into the character of witnesses now. All right. Here. Okay, ma'am, if you would raise your right hand. You stay up, raise your right hand, please. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? All right, please be seated. <coughs> Good morning, Attorney Daniels. Would you state your name, address, and position for the record? Nancy Daniels, 
4948 Southern Oaks Drive, Tallahassee. And my current position is a legislative consultant with the Florida Public Defender Association. And how long have you been uh, associated with that organization? Since I retired from being the public defender in 19, it, excuse me, in 2017. And you said that you retired from the public defender's office. Were you the public defender here in this county, the elected public defender? Yes, I was. And, what the, and that was the public defender for the, these six counties? Yes, the second judicial circuit. All right. <clears throat> now, were you just the person who actually was the head of the division, or, or did you actually deal with the cases as well? Both. I was the manager as the elected public defender, but I also carried a caseload. I did, did the drug court for uh, the whole time of drug court. I also carried some cases then that didn't settle in drug court process and carried felony caseloads when we needed it, and just various things along the way. All right. Were you also an FSU professor at one time? Yes. A, yes. Yeah, and I was from um, 1985 to 1990 a clinical professor at Florida State College of Law, and I'm still an adjunct professor. Okay. How do you know, uh, would you please tell the panel how you know uh, Judge Hobbs? Well, in anticipating this, I've been trying to remember the first time I met her, and I really don't remember, except in general terms, um, in the 90s, I, I became public defender in 1990, and I believe somewhere along there, she went into private practice and was practicing with Carolyn Cummings, who I knew from the community and various things and I I just met Barbara you know around the courthouse um, in the community here and there was she practicing under the uh, under a law firm of the name of Hobbs and Cummings at that time yes All right. is that the same Carolyn Cummings who is a county commissioner here in in uh, Leon County yes <clears throat> Now, when you became involved with her, uh, as far as uh, your knowledge of her, tell us how you interacted and, and the locations and places that you may have come in contact with her. Mostly in the courtroom. Um, she, would, she would have cases, and she would be coming to court, and I would be there with cases. She had quite a few clients in drug court, so I would see her there. Uh, every other Friday, we had drug court, and. I'd see her there quite a bit, and then I'd see her in other um, divisions of the court. And, and I would say we were, you know, friendly acquaintances throughout this period of time. Now, have you ever, at some point in time, of course, she moved to the bench as a circuit court judge. Have you ever had the opportunity to uh, interact with her in any way while she was on the circuit court bench? I have not had a case in front of her myself, no. Mm -hmm. But you just know of her from your interaction with her in the community? Yes, um, people in my office were practicing in her divisions, and I would get feedback and you know, right. things, but I personally didn't have occasion to have a case in front of her. All right. Now, but given the contact between uh, yourself as well as those around you, those who were in the, in the office. Uh, do you have any opinion regarding this, her uh, demeanor and fairness that, that she exhibited as a judge? Yes, I, I thought she was a fair-minded judge. By no means was she automatically always ruling for the defense, but um, certain types of cases where she was actually pretty tough on, on uh, criminal defendants. And, um, but other, other cases, I've found that she, at least the, 
impression I had from, you know, from my office was that uh, she was good at uh, figuring out which cases were deserved um, serious consequences and which ones go with lighter sentences. All right. Based on your observations of her and the contact that you had uh, with her over these years, are you of the opinion, do you have an opinion about her honesty, trustworthiness as a public servant? I do. I, I have no, never had any occasion to see anything other than her being honest and trustworthy. I never knew her to lie or misstate anything. found that she was uh, an effective public servant. Right. Now, do you have any thoughts or opinions regarding her continuous, continued service on the court benefit, the court bench being beneficial, being beneficial to the community itself? Yes, I thought she was an asset to the bench. Uh, she was mm. a, a local a uh, locally raised person who really knew Tallahassee and this circuit very well. Um, she, you know, came up through the community and understood people in our community very well, I thought. And uh, she had a, a good appreciation of people's uh, problems that brought them into the courthouse. And uh, I, th I think she has been an asset to the court. I know that she has done um, a lot to develop a mental health court in Gadsden County, which is valuable, and uh, been a supporter of our specialty courts, our veterans treatment court, uh, various things we do to try to help people. All right. and, uh, been a good judge. All right. I have no further questions. Any cross-examination? No, we Any questions from the panel? No, sir. All right. Thank you very much, ma'am. You're free to go. We have one more character witness, our last witness. <laughs> that is Reverend Glenn. While we're waiting, are you all going to want five, ten minutes to get your closing arguments together after the last witness? No. After the last witness goes, are you going to want five or ten minutes to get your closing argument together? Yes, I would appreciate it. Okay, yeah. and I was thinking 20 minutes aside, is a problem for anyone? Okay. And, uh, if it please, uh, the panel, uh, as far as the uh, division regarding uh, uh, Judge Hobbs, uh, I'm going to be given the closing argument, but I'm going to reserve five minutes because there will be some discussion regarding uh, the recommendation that will be made and the law uh, that we think <coughs> and the law that we believe is, is pertinent in this case. So it will be, we'll divide that up, but it's my understanding you said 20 minutes per right, side. I think Mr. Williams has the burden, so he gets to divide the time. So he'll have. I'll go first, and you, and then I guess Mr. Powell can give a your, um, and you can split that up. However, and then I'll get a rebuttal, and we can adjourn. Okay. All right. All right. Um, sir, if I could have you just stand and raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. All right. Please be seated. Good afternoon, Reverend Burns. Yes, sir. Would you state your complete name for the record, your position, and your address here in, in this community? Certainly. It's Irvin Glenn Burns. And, uh, and what was the other one? And, and that is, what is your, uh, your address and your title at this point? <clears throat> okay. My address is 2122 Willie Voss Road in Tallahassee, 32303. 
and I'm with the Good Samaritan Network Executive Director of the Good Samaritan, Good Samaritan Network. And the, would you make sure, I don't know if they got that. What was the name of the business or cup that you're working for? The ministry is Good Samaritan Network. All right. What kind of, uh, of service is that, sir? Primarily, we're a reentry program for men coming out of prison. We have home, transitional homes for men coming out of prison. We have uh, a home for women called Chelsea House. And then we have uh, food pantries primarily in the area. All right. And how long have you had that business? Well, we've been in the ministry for 22 years with it. Has it all been here in the uh, Leon County community? Yes, sir. If you would, sir, please tell this uh, panel how you know Judge Hobbs. Well, I first met Judge Hobbs through my wife, um, who had known Judge Hobbs when she had, a, she had one of her children in her, uh, in her class as a, when Judge Hobbs was a single mother. My wife was a kindergarten teacher and a sixth grade elementary teacher. And then I didn't know her then. Um, I met her actually at our church when she was uh, first running for office. All right. And uh, was that back in the early uh, 2000? Yes. 2013, 2014, mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. Early 2000s, I'm not sure what year it was. Uh -huh. And <clears throat> after you, I think you said you gained that knowledge of her through your wife. Correct. Tell us about the interaction that you may have had with her. Well, uh, again, primarily uh, with cases, we had men that uh, were either going to prison or coming back out of prison, um, that we were processing their life. And uh, occasionally we were in front of a judge uh, on various cases that she had. So we dealt with her as, as regards to um, our men primarily. Um, and then on a personal level, Judge Hobbs used to bring her mother in the last few years of her life. She used to, we have a thrift store. She used to bring her mother over to our thrift store about every month a month to go shopping. So we got to know them just as people in the store and friends. Right. Now, let me be clear as to what exactly do you do at that uh, community center for those who are, are leaving or uh, might have been incarcerated. Ours is a reentry program. It's a faith-based reentry program, and what, what we primarily do is uh, we go into prisons and we work with men, trying to help them prepare for transitioning in, transitioning back into society. We have a we have residential programming, employment, uh, education that we network with uh, other agencies in town, and um, so we we are working with them from before they get out, uh, and then hopefully to successfully reenter society. Our, our group, we had a study done by FSU a few years ago in our group of 500 men that were kind of the, the target audience, if you will, of some of the most difficult to place uh, um, sex offenders, uh, capital murder, uh, crimes, and such as that. And we had, so it was a very difficult group to work with recidivism rate, but our recidivism rate is about 8%. So and a lot of it's because we work with um, professionals and people that know their end of the business and then we take care of the spiritual end of it. And how would exactly Judge Hobbs interact or come in contact with those that you were working with? She was and, and has been um, very interactive with us when we would, when I would talk to her, I would call her and talk not about a particular case as far as in front of her, but a case, the, the concept of what we were going through and what was di the difficulties they were facing or something uh, about which way to go in that regard and she would give me direction and trying to uh, she would come and talk with the guys as far as a, in a in a group setting type of format so that she could uh, give them principles uh, from a legal perspective well given that interaction with her do you have any opinions regarding uh, first of all her demeanor and fairness that she had exhibited uh, with during the contact with your uh, persons that you were working with while she was on the circuit bench it's very helpful because a lot of our a lot of our men have a very negative opinion of the judicial system and they're defensive about it she was disarming she was very frank with them um, but she was not condescending and she was uh, she's always willing to listen to them and um, and then give good counsel back as far as the principles that she was trying to implement impl with them sir based on your interaction with her uh, do you have an opinion about whether or not she appears to be an honest, trustworthy public servant? <clears throat> she has always been very solid with us, everything I've asked her, and, and, and uh, all the dealings we've had with her 
have been very professional but very caring. Do you have any opinion about whether or not her continued service on the court bench would be beneficial to this community? I have a great deal of opinion about that. Judge, judge and, and there are several other judges in our community that are voices for the voiceless. I mean, they, they've gone way beyond the call of duty as far as taking the time in situations when people would have just been passed through the system because of the caseloads, if nothing else, and they would take the time to let us go through. And, and um, I guess the best example I can give you is we had a guy that was, had not failed to register, and he moved out from our program just about the time they were getting a check. He didn't take care of his business, and he ended up getting uh, charged with that. But in the meantime, he had gone somewhere else and caught another charge and done some more prison time, went through the whole process of out processing prison, and, um, and that got missed. And so when he got out, he came back to us, we got him a job, he was doing much better in employment, and then the old, the old failure to register caught up with him. And when they did, they arrested him, they picked him up on a Friday night. Uh, he, of course, would have been sitting for some time for the thing to process through. I got a hold of, between the state and the public defender's office and judge, they assigned him to us while that was processing. Eventually that all fleshed out, they didn't have to go in and do any additional time. But it took 30 days or so for that to happen. In the meantime, he was still employed and he's done well since then. That's the kind of thing that I'm talking about there. And I know I'm not a lawyer and I know that there's rules you gotta go by. But taking that little bit of extra time and getting everybody involved, put a, put a, kept a guy on employed, took care of his family, and showed care in the community to a group, quite frankly, that didn't have, as I said, a, by and large, we don't trust the judicial system. And so her voice is a very important voice in our community, judicially speaking. All right. Okay. Thank you. I have no further questions. Any cross examination? No, sir. Anything from the panel? Okay. Anything further on behalf? I'm um, sorry, you're free to leave. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. <coughs> All right, anything further on behalf of the respondent? No, Your Honor. The Judge Hawks agrees. Okay. And any rebuttal from the JQC? No, sir. All right, let's come back at uh, 2.35. Each side will have 20, uh, 20 minutes. Uh, Mr. Williams is entitled to divide that time between uh, opening uh, argument and a rebuttal argument. Um, Mr. Randolph, you can divide the 20 minutes however you feel appropriate between you and your co-counsel. Um, the panel will, may have questions for each of you. Um, no questions for Mr. Williams after his rebuttal, so I want that way both attorneys have a chance to respond. And that time the panel may or may not have questions for you. If they do have questions, that won't count against your 20 minutes, and I'll ask let the panel wait until the end of your 20 minutes before they ask any questions. Okay, uh, we'll be in recess.
Do you control that light up there? Who does? Who does it? Council, Judge Hobbs, members of the panel. This case is sort of a study in what not to do. I'm going to read a couple of canons that were charged and that I think are particularly applicable to this case. Uh, I believe your counsel, Ms. Ross, uh, provided you with a copy of the canons, but these are the canons that I think are particularly helpful in understanding the facts that we've discussed and the incidents in this case. I'm going to start with Canon 1. Canon 1 is titled, A Judge Shall Uphold the Integrity and Independence of the Judiciary. It states that an independent and honorable judiciary is indispensable to justice in our society. A judge should participate in establishing and maintaining and enforcing the high standards of conduct and shall personally observe those standards so that the integrity and independence of the judiciary may be preserved. The provisions of this code should be construed and applied to further that objective. Particularly relevant is also Canon 2. It's titled, A Judge Shall Avoid Impropriety and the Appearance of Impropriety in All of the Judge's Activities. 2A states that a judge shall respect and comply with the law and shall act at all times in a manner that promotes public confidence in the integrity and impartiality of the judiciary. The commentary to Canon 2A, I think, is particularly informative here. The commentary to 2A states, irresponsible or improper conduct by judges erodes public confidence in the judiciary, period. A judge must avoid all impropriety and appearance of impropriety, period. A judge must expect to be the subject of constant public scrutiny. A judge must therefore accept restrictions on the judge's conduct that might be viewed as burdensome by the ordinary citizen and should, freely, should do so freely and willingly. Finally, turning to Canon 5. Canon 5 regulates the judge's extrajudicial activities, activities occurring outside of their normal duties. In this case, referring to her representation of her son during his police interrogation, Canon 5 is titled, A judge shall regulate extrajudicial activities to minimize the risk of conflict with judicial duties. 5A1 says, a judge shall conduct all of the judge's extrajudicial activities so that they do not, subpart 1, cast reasonable doubt on the judge's capacity to act impartially as a judge, 2, undermine the judge's independence, integrity, or impartiality, and 6, to appear to a reasonable person to be coercive. I'm not going to belabor too much Judge Hobbs' representation of her son. I think we've covered that pretty thoroughly. But she did admit it's a violation. Judge Sostrom said it was the most significant ethics violation he's seen, and he's been a chief judge and a judge for a long time. She's also acknowledged, after questioning uh, by, I believe it was Judge Evander and other members of the panel, that she should have disclosed or recused from the cases where Mr. Roberts was representing clients. And even if she thought that the state knew about the conflict, the code requires that the judge disclose or recuse. It's not up to some, the judge to let someone else take care of that, maybe. In this case, because of, the, uh, because of her relationship, the canons, and as interpreted by the JEAC, they require her to recuse. There are two JEAC opinions that I think are particularly relevant to that point. The first is JEAC opinion 2012-37. 
where the question posed is, must a judge recuse from cases involving the attorney and law firm which represented the judge, the judge's mother, and the judge's brother in a personal injury case which settled without going to trial? The case is over, and the judge is asking if they have to recuse from cases involving that attorney. The answer, yes. The judge must recuse from cases involving that attorney who represented the judge and her family members on a case that had already ended. The second question posed by JEAC Opinion 2012-37 asks, must the judge, upon no longer being required to recuse, disclose the relationship to parties in a case in which that attorney or law firm appears? And the answer from the JEAC is yes, for a reasonable period of time. That did not occur at all in this case. <coughs> The Supreme Court knows what they're doing in terms of the canons, and if they wanted to make an exception to the canons for just passing cases or just moving things along, that could have been in the commentary, but it's not. There is no exception to the canons requiring disqualification. Let's talk for a minute about the Talking Points Memo. I, I don't know about you, but there was a lot of a uh, confusing testimony. So let me see if I can pull that together for us. The Talking Points Memo was prepared by Mr. Sladen and given to Chief Judge Sostrom for use in a conference with Judge Hobbs. Judge Sostrom and Mr. Sladen both agreed that the only people present were the three of them. Judge Sostrom wasn't clear on when that meeting occurred. Mr. Sladen, who prepared the memo, was very clear that it occurred within a day or two of the son's arrest, which would have been on or around August 1st. In that memo and in that counseling session, Mr. Sladen and Mr. Sostrom, or Judge Sostrom, advised that they told Judge Hobbs that Judge, uh, her judicial assistant should not appear in court in her son's cases and should not sit at council table. Just a few days later, on August 5th, Ms. Ware is back in court in Mr. Haynes' case and is again at council table. I believe Judge Sostrom referred to that as unfathomable. Regarding the preferential treatment, Mr. Sladen was quite certain that Judge Hobbs asked him whether the video option he was telling her about was recorded. Judge Hobbs also uh, today admitted that she did ask whether that was a recorded line, and then had this, I believe, stunning explanation for why she didn't want it recorded. She said, and I wrote this down, I'm a public official. I don't want my personal stuff out there. I don't get that benefit. Members of the public don't get that privilege. If I have a loved one in jail, I can pick up the phone and call them. If subject to be recorded, it's subject to be monitored. Regarding the badge issue, Judge Hobbs says she wasn't aware of that, and of course, I don't, we have no evidence to suggest that she had any prior knowledge that that would occur. But she had a duty to train her judicial assistant not to give her security badge to other people so they could access secure portions of the courthouse. She further had a duty after this event occurred and she was made aware of it, and after she was told by Chief Judge Sostrom that this is such a serious concern that it's probably a fireable offense, I would submit she had a duty to fire the judicial assistant, but she did not. Regarding the domestic violence injunction filed by Ms. Rosa, this occurred by all accounts that I could keep track of 
after Judge Sostrom told Judge Hobbs and Ms. Ware not to be involved in the Haynes matters, if not once, several times. Judge Hobbs testified that she told Ms. Ware to let it go, to let it be in God's hands. But she still did not terminate Ms. Ware after her involvement in this matter. Regarding the family division issues, Judge Hobbs served almost 17 months in the family division in Leon County when she first came on the bench. She was transferred to Gadsden County and then back to Leon and then her son was arrested shortly thereafter. The three cases referred to in this matter, the Pittman matter, the Riley matter, and the Wood Noel matter. Regarding the Pittman case, the emergency motion was filed September 19th. No determination was made on that emergency motion by Judge Hobbs until October 18th of 2019. She says she didn't know or thought the magistrate might take care of that, but she was a family judge for a long time in Leon County. She should know better. And regarding the Riley matter, <clears throat> the emergency motion was filed August 26, 2019. No determination, no determination was filed with the clerk until 10-24 of 19. August, September, October. Judge Hobbs says she was absent for some or part of that time. The email she provided this morning as part of her exhibit says that she was out from 9-3 to 9-6, and there may have been senior judges available to cover her regular docket. But remember Judge Sostrom and even Mr. Sladen to some extent mentioned that emergency motions are not regular motions. Judge Sostrom went so far as to say his JA would bring them to him if they were in court. He would get them done that, if not that moment, that day. But even if Judge Hobbs didn't handle that emergency motion on 826 when it was filed, or 827, 828, 829, 830, 9-1, 9-2, the days she was absent, 9-3 to 9-6, she could have and should have, I would submit, instructed her judicial assistant to find another judge, take that to a senior judge. Maybe it got lost, maybe her judicial assistant didn't remember it was there, maybe she didn't remember it was there. It should have been taken to another judge. Judge Hobbs had a duty to make sure that someone was handling that. Neither of those things happened, and that's a failure to timely handle the emergency matters by Judge Hobbs, and a failure to supervise her judicial assistant, on the other hand. Regarding the Wood and Noel matter, Ms. Harris testified, I believe truthfully, to the statements attributed to Ms. Ware. When Ms. Ware came to Ms. Harris, the case manager, and said, what do I do with this emergency pleading? And Ms. Harris said, well, you need to set it for a hearing. It's an emergency. Call the parties, schedule a time with the judge's calendar. The judicial assistant keeps the judge's calendar, not the case manager. And what does Judy Ware say? I ain't got time for that shit. Print me a new face sheet, meaning a blank copy. I'll, I will have the judge redesignated as non-emergency. That's stunning. If you were the petitioner who filed that emergency motion, and we're not here to determine whether it was actually a, a real emergency or just something, the point and the fact of the matter is that petitioner had a right to have a judge consider the facts of that motion, not the inconvenience 
of the judicial assistant who couldn't be bothered to locate the parties and set the hearing. That's outrageous. There are 15 minutes. Yes, sir. I'm going to reserve the rest of my time. All right. Let me uh, start on the left here. Um, Mr. Tyra, do you have any questions for Mr. Williams? Judge Ruth? You know? Mr. White? Okay. All right, Mr. Randolph. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, I'd like to say to this panel, I really appreciate on behalf of Judge Hobbs and myself and Mr. Powell here, Attorney Powell, we appreciate the tentativeness that, that you have given this case. I appreciate the comment made by one of the uh, panel members here uh, at the beginning where you said, look, we have some people who are very talented, they understand, you can, you can go forward with the information presented and we can move this case through. That's exactly what has happened. All of you had questions throughout and I really appreciate that because I think it, it from our standpoint, it made, it made the case go a lot smoother and we were able to get through it. As I said, I'm going to reserve at least five minutes of my time for recommendations and Mr. Powell will come up after I finish uh, to uh, give those recommendations. But what I want to do is center on what you have heard here today, uh, the factual situation. He'll talk about the law. He'll make, as far as the recommendations that will be made, that's something that you will hear directly from him. But let's talk about this. In this case, the, it, it appears that the first allegation, there's no question, that's the most serious one. The one which Judge Hobbs went to the police station that night and she told the police uh, that, of course, uh, that I am his attorney. I think the, the comment was made that well, now, you can't see him unless you are his attorney. So she says, I guess I'm his attorney. Well, she made the decision that night, okay? She was acting more as a mother than she was a judge. Now, we can criticize that uh, uh, determination that was made by her, the decision, but she made it, and she made it honestly uh, thinking and, and maybe she wasn't thinking clearly, but she was thinking about her son. She was the only one who knew about her son, what kind of person he is, but she understood clearly, I need to tell him to come in and tell the truth about what happened. And that's what this was, was, was all about. She wanted to get to him uh, to make sure that he gave the police that station, that, that particular, uh, 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 the, the facts of the case. Now I can tell you, I, don't, I forgot to ask Mr. Roberts this case, but I've been a prosecutor myself for a number of years. I was a prosecutor before I became a defense lawyer for a number of years. There is no defense lawyers that would have allowed their client faced with that kind of charge to give a statement to the police without sitting down and talking, and maybe most of them would not have allowed them until they were able to find out some facts in that case. Because once you, you give a statement to the police, that's your statement. That is what is going to govern in this case. But that's what she did. And I said, my own version of it, I tell you, Nine out of ten would not have done that. But she did it because that was her son. And in her mind, her son was more important at that point in time than anything else that was before her. Now, so let's, let's be honest. When she appeared there that night, everybody knew who she was. There was no question they knew she was a circuit judge sitting on that bench sending people to jail every day. 
Because that's what your job is. And sometimes if you're on a felony bench here in Leon County, folk go to jail. And that's part of her job. But she made that decision, and we told you from the beginning in this case, that was the wrong decision. She made the wrong decision. She thought more as a mother than what she would should have, that she also wore that robe. That's what happened in this particular case. What you find is this, and my, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Powell's gonna talk about it, but think about this in, in looking at, listening to the testimony that you had. This was her, this is the first time Judge Hawes has had a problem that came before the Judicial Qualifications Commission. This is her first time, and she doesn't want it to be her last time. But it's the first time. She had not been in any trouble before. But she made a mistake, and she admitted it. She came before you at the beginning of this case and said, yes, I violated the canons. I want you to know why, but I violated the canons. And what do we do? We said the same thing, and we also said, you need to know right up front that there's some mitigation here. And what was the mitigation? We, we saw the tape, you saw the video, but you heard this is under oath signed by that detective that you saw in that video. And what does he say? I am the lead investigator during the interview. And he says, Judge Hawes did not hinder, nor did her presence in the interview room hinder TPD's investigation of the incident and the questioning of her son. Yes. She made some, uh, she asked some questions. Yes, she said other things about having her son go home after the question. But what did the detective say? He is the one in, in the position to know whether or not she hindered the investigation or not. We can't do that. He is the one who charged her that particular night. So no matter what was shown on that video, his statement remains on the oath that this that Judge Hobbs did nothing to hinder, nor did her president in the interview room hinder TPD's investigation in this case. And he said correctly, the only time she told him not to say anything was when he went off on his talk, talk about an STD. And you, you saw it, she said, look, look, stay, stay focused. Listen to what he has to say. She know, knew her son, but she made a mistake. So we aren't, we aren't here denying that, but I think that you, and I, I hope that you were able to take this in consideration about what that detective said that night. Now, let's talk briefly about these, some of these others. You, you, you took a lot of notes, and I, so I think you know what the facts are in this case. Um, the, the second area was whether or not she sought preferential treatment. I don't think there's any question that in, in this case, if you look at it by clear and convincing evidence, they have not met the standard in this case. They have not proved that allegation. Judge Schultz said initially, we were trying to help her because she wanted to see her son, okay? And then they went out trying to help her. They couldn't get it together. And then Judge, Judge uh, Schuster felt at that point in time that, well, maybe, uh, I don't know what she's doing. Maybe she's trying to, to, to make sure that she could monitor or, or, or have uh, these calls made that would not be uh, heard by law enforcement while she was out there between her son. Now, think about this. She already had Gary Ross involved in the case. There's nothing that she's gonna be able to whisper or say anything to him that was going to affect his defense. Mr. Roberts, an experienced attorney, was in control of that case at that time, from that day forward. So what she was trying to do, she wanted to see him to, we don't know how he interacts. You got a, just an idea from just looking at him on this video as to what kind of person he is. She had to deal with it. And so what the, uh, so when they say preferential treatment, that hasn't been proven because what happened? The sheriff 
uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, the the sheriff, we call him uh, the chief out there. The chief came in here and he told you exactly uh, what happened. He says, no, she didn't talk to me about any preferential treatment. We, she was just talking about the uh, what about the uh, system itself. She couldn't get it to work, and she he went back to her, and they made and he got it working, and she's using that system today. There was no effort to go through anybody else that the general public would be able to see to suggest that she wanted preferential treatment. She was only getting something. He said that from this witness stand. There's no preferential treatment. She got exactly what others would have gotten in this case. Now, very briefly, I know that our time is, is uh, I wanted to, uh, so we don't think that that, by clear and convincing evidence, that, that there's any proof in this case at all on, to, on that particular one. Now, we talked about this recusal. And, and by the way, before I forget it, she self-reported this now. This is not something they had to find out about later. She went to her, went to chief, went to the uh, her uh, chief, Schuster, and uh, he, she told him what happened, and he, in fact, called the JQC. She knew she would had done something wrong, but she self-reported. She also. Uh, had sought some counseling downstate from the lady that uh, Judge Schustrom had uh, from West Palm Beach. The Judge Schustrom had said that you to talk to. And she, I think she indicated you that she did talk to this lady. It's a wellness center. So it's not like she was not trying to do what is right here. We believe the evidence suggests that she did. So. And, and that particular one, as far as uh, what happened on the recusals, it's not there. Let me, let me say this. I noticed there were a lot of questions of all of you asking about the policy here in this circuit. Judge Houston clearly said that we don't have standing orders here. That is, apparently, that is not what happens around the state of Florida. If there was a mandate saying that it was wrong, that's exactly what uh, it would have been changed. But that is our policy. It has been our policy. There's no standing order of recusal. It's a case-by-case -case basis. So I ask you, in the, looking at that charge, to remember that's what it is, whether you like it or not, that it, it just doesn't make sense to you, and it very well may not. But that is what we, we're dealing with on that particular account. And in looking at that, when Mr. Roberts appeared in front of her initially, she did not have to recuse herself. Now, at some point, if he had been, she had remained on that case, and if he had filed some motions in front of her, then, of course, there, there would definitely have been some recusal. And, and if you remember what Judge Hobbs said at the end, she says, look, I'm thinking back over it. I sh maybe I should have just recused myself. Well, maybe she should, but that's not what we're dealing with here. It is what, the, what the, was required of her by the second judicial circuit. And the canons, and, and I want to be clear, this is what we're, that is what I think should be the governing force in the term. And if you look at that standard, it did not happen. Mr. Roberts cleared up both of those cases. It never went back in front of her. Now, one, just a couple topics. I'm not sure about my time. You're about 13 and a half minutes. Oh, okay. Um, let me go quickly. As far as the seeking preferential treatment, uh, no, not seeking preferential treatment, the other, the failure to supervise, uh, think about what the evidence has been. She was out of town. Uh, a number of weeks. You remember her testimony. Her mother died. She was not here. Things happened in the case. And if I, I heard what counsel said a few months ago, but if my recollection is that when something goes wrong, it's the JA and the case manager 
uh, that would, would have been contacted. And you heard in this case, the clerk made a mistake in that third case. So they didn't get it right, they messed it up, not intentionally, but Judge Hall was not being there and then the charges brought against her based on uh, what had occurred while she was out of town. And that's exactly what happened on that third charge. And then just briefly, that same uh, case of which that occurred, if you recall, this is the one where uh, uh, Ms. Harris testified about, this. that's the same case. And Ms. Harris uh, said that she went in the office, that she was, she was summoned there to come in, and she did. And she went in that office and she talked uh, to uh, Judge Halls. But I remember some very probing questions coming from uh, the panel about that. Nobody threatened Ms. Harris. She simply asked her about those three cases. You asked her, first there was some claim that maybe she had to be transferred out of this county. That somehow, because she had made that statement that, that somebody, she was interfering and that uh, that should not have been made. That's not what the evidence was. She, Ms. Ms. Harris told us, in fact, that she, uh, she no, it was already in process. She was, she was getting ready to, to leave the county. That charge has not been uh, made. So I want to thank you. Uh, 15 minutes runs out very okay. quick. All right. Uh, Mr. Powell, you have five minutes. Five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, let me start by saying that the uh, Florida Supreme Court, in the case of Henry Holder, 195 Southern 3rd, 1133, 1138, Florida, 2016, stated and reaffirmed that the object of disciplinary proceedings is not for the purpose of inflicting punishment, but rather to gauge a judge's fitness to serve as an impartial judicial officer. In that respect, as to the charge of legal representation of her son at the time of his interrogation by law enforcement, Judge Hobbs is suggesting a public reprimand for violation of canons 1, 2, and 5G. As to canons 5A and 5A2, Judge Hobbs is suggesting dismissal Canon 5A refers to extrajudicial activities in general. Then the canon gives specifics, which one is 5G, the practice of law. As to the charge of giving the appearance of preferential treatment and having access to her son while he was in jail, Judge Hobbs suggests a dismissal. As to the charge of failing to recuse herself, Judge Hobbs suggests dismissal. As to the charge of failing to appropriately supervise her judicial assistant, Judge Hobbs suggests dismissal. As to the charge of failing to issue timely orders and decisions on the three cases, Judge Hobbs suggests dismissal. As to the charge of summoning the case manager and interrogating the case manager to discover the source of the JQC's information, Judge Hobbs suggests dismissal. One other thing I want to point out in terms of the disqualification and the commentary to Canon 3E1, states the last paragraph, by decisional law, the rule of necessity may override the rule of disqualification. So our interpretation is that there is 
there is an exception to mandatory disqualification, and that is the rule of necessity, and that comment goes on to give an example of that rule of necessity. Thank you. Right, thank you. Uh, any questions for Judge Hobbs, counsel, Mr. White? Driver? Mr. Fino? No, sir. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, Mr. Williams have about five minutes for rebuttal. First, on the last point about the rule of necessity, if you read the full commentary, what it says is that the judge is required to disclose. It didn't happen in this case. There are a couple of cases I would like to bring to your attention. The first is the case of N. James Turner. Judge Turner was removed, in part, for writing letters describing himself as an attorney on behalf of his mother, who was undergoing foreclosure. The court and the commission rejected Judge Turner's defense that he was, quote, in a panic and mistakenly believed the canons permitted his actions. The court especially noted that a, the canon 5G explicitly states that a judge must not, however, act as an advocate or negotiator for a family member of the judge's family in a legal matter, period. Excuse me, Mr. Yes, sir. Mr. Witt, you say uh, she was undergoing, what was that word? I just didn't hear you. The, the mom was undergoing. Foreclosure, I think. Foreclosure. Yes, the mom was undergoing a foreclosure. Foreclosure, okay. The other case is N. Ray Counts, and I have copies of the case for Ms. Ross to provide to you if she has not already. Judge Counts was publicly reprimanded for, among other things, representing her own sister at a first appearance hearing before a judge. She argued on her sister's behalf and made requests of law enforcement for retrieving personal allowing her sister to retrieve personal items. Judge Counts denied that she intended to violate the canons and believed that her uh, conduct was appropriate, but stipulated that it was not. Remember, in commission proceedings, scienter, malfeasance, intent is not required to be demonstrated. It's also worth noting that the commission and the court noted Judge Counts did not identify herself as a judge, and yet she was still sanctioned. Nor, and the court specifically noted this, nor did Judge Counts make any arguments other than that envisioned by the rules of criminal procedure during this hearing. Well, let's talk about that for a second, because on the video of Judge Hobbs, where she's with her son in the interrogation room, she's making requests of the investigators. So contrary to Judge Counts, where she's talking to a judge, Judge Hobbs is talking to police officers, investigators, who may have to appear in front of her to testify, because at that time, she is a circuit criminal judge in the county that they are in. She's making requests of them that are wholly inappropriate to release my son to me. The officer explains, I can't when I believe I have probable cause that a felony offense has occurred. She actually asks at one point if they can issue a notice. That's not even permitted by the rules of criminal procedure. Rule 3.125 only allows notices, desk appearances, whatever we want to call them, for misdemeanors. These are serious felony charges. She would know that since she was a criminal defense attorney. The last case I'd like to highlight for you is N. Ray McMillan. In this, the court noted, I'm sorry, is uh, N. Ray Henson. It says, the court, the, in, in this case, the court said, we have previously removed judges despite strong character evidence and unblemished judicial records when their misconduct was fundamentally inconsistent with the responsibilities of judicial office or struck at the heart of judicial integrity. Ladies and gentlemen, I can't think of something that strikes more at the heart of judicial integrity than sitting as a, serving, as a circuit judge 
representing your son in the same county and making inappropriate requests of the people interrogating him in a very serious crime. I think if you start with that and add in the additional misconduct that admittedly flowed mostly all from that original incident, Judge Hobbs' failure to recuse herself from cases with Mr. Roberts, that did predate the arrest, but it's just as concerning. Ms. Ware loaning her security badge to Mr. Haynes. Ms. R uh, Ms. Rosa filing an injunction with Ms. Ware's help. Compounding that with her failure to properly administer the family division that she had to be transferred into because of this situation. I believe, and the precedent cases support this, that a significant sanction is appropriate. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, before we break, um, there was an issue on the video about sealing it. If you're going to file a motion with the panel, make sure you want you to do it by Friday. Friday, by Friday at 5 o'clock. Okay, with that, we will be in recess and we can go off the record.